Good morning, everyone. My name is Kevin Mullen, Chair of the Board, and I'll just uh, do a quick check. Um, good morning, Mr. Battles. Welcome. This is your first time um, in a rate hearing case before us. Do you have everyone from Blue Cross Blue Shield that's necessary for testimony with you? Uh, I'm just looking at the participant list, um, which I don't see the entire group, but as I see Ruth now. Is, is Paul there as well? You're muted, Ruth, but we take that as a yes. <laughs> I'm here too, yes, he is. Good morning. Sorry. Okay. Uh, um, we do, yes. Super. Health advocate Mike Fisher, how about you and your team? Good morning, Mr. Chair. I think we are all here, yes. Okay. So the first order of business, I'm going to invoke GMCB rule number one trillion and one H and waive any ne necessary requirement for anyone to wear a jacket today. <laughs> With that, That's the second the order of business, I'm going to appoint Michael Barber as the hearing officer for the hearing and turn everything over to Mike. Whenever you're ready, Mike. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, before I start, I just want to make sure that we have Tom Pelham with us because I don't see him. So I see him, but I don't see, I don't his, see his, his face. <laughs> Tom, are you with us? I can reach out to him, Mike. This is Susan Barrett. He shows up under the. Oh, uh, there he is. There we go. <laughs> Hi, Tom. It's that Berlin thing going on. <laughs> Good morning. Okay, so uh, as you heard, I've been designated by uh, Board Chair Kevin Mullen to serve as the hearing officer for today's hearing. The purpose of this hearing is to take evidence and argument on Blue Cross and Blue Shield of Vermont's 2023 individual and small group rate filings. The docket numbers for these cases are GMCB. Dash zero zero three dash two two RR and GMCB dash zero zero four dash two two RR. The hearing is being held pursuant to eighteen VSA forty sixty two. Uh, representing <clears throat> Blue Cross today is uh, Benjamin Battles from the law firm Pollock Collin LLP. Representing the Office of the Healthcare Advocate, uh, R.J. Angoff the law firm Mary and Scallop PLLC, as well as HCA attorneys Eric Schulteis and Charles Becker. I also want to recognize the board's attorney, Laura Beliveau, uh, who's joining us today. <clears throat> um, I think we, we've established that all the board members can hear and be heard. Um, if anyone's having trouble, <clears throat> Here, please, uh, please let me know. Um, uh, Mike, just one uh, uh, point of clarification. Um, I believe we have a new uh, uh, court reporter, and I'm just not sure if they are on. Can we confirm that? Yes, I'm on. This Great. is Lee Miller. Thank you. Uh, we are recording today's hearing. Um, as we heard, we also have a court reporter here to transcribe the proceedings. We will um, get the parties uh, a copy of the transcript as soon as we receive it. Um, for members of the public uh, who may be on the call, um, we will be taking public comment at the end of today's proceedings. However, I don't know when that will be, so if you don't want to sit through what's going to be a long day of witness testimony. We are having a, a meeting this Thursday afternoon from four o'clock to six o'clock that will be dedicated exclusively to hearing from the public on um, the individual and small group filings from Blue Cross as well as MVP, the other carrier offering plans in these markets. <clears throat> Information about that meeting can be found by going to the Green Mountain Care Board's website and clicking on the rate review tab. Um, additionally, you can submit written comments to the board via our website 
uh, or by written mail through this Thursday. Um, before we begin, I just want to remind the board and the parties to exercise caution regarding information in the binders that's been uh, marked as confidential, as these matters can't be discussed in the public portion of the hearing. Um, if it becomes necessary to discuss confidential materials, we do have uh, a separate line for a potential executive session. <clears throat> um, just so that you guys are aware, the, the confidential materials in the binder are blue highlighted in, in this hearing. Um, so we received uh, binders with 28 exhibits um, on July 14th. As I understand it, all the exhibits that we received in that binder were stipulated to by the parties. Um, on July 15th, we received four additional exhibits, exhibits 29 through 32. I understand exhibit 29 has been stipulated to, uh, but not exhibits 30 through 32. Um, did I get that right, Mr. Battles and Mr. Angoff? That was my understanding as of Friday, unless uh, the healthcare advocate has um, change their position on any of uh, exhibits 30 through 32, then uh, uh, then we'll propose to address those during testimony. I'm not aware that we've changed our position on 30 through 32, so those would still be not stipulated to. Okay. That's my understanding too. Does anybody, do any of the board members uh, the court reporter, does anyone not have all 32 exhibits? He should have gotten 29 through 32 via email. Kevin, you're, mal you're, you're muted. <laughs> I was just saying, Mike, if you could speak up, it would be greatly appreciated. OK, sorry. Uh, OK, sounds like everyone has all the exhibits, um, and I assume neither party objects to me admitting exhibits one through twenty nine into the into evidence at this time. No objection. No objection. Okay, then consider that done and Mr. Battles uh, will take up exhibits 30 through 32 uh, during the hearing. Sounds good, thank you. So that is all I have. Um, now we'll move to opening statements if either party would like to make an opening statement. Mr. Battles, you wanna go first? Uh, yes, thank you, Mr. Barber, and good morning, Chair Mullen and members of the board. Uh, my name is Ben Battles, and I represent Blue Cross and Blue Shield of Vermont. Uh, we are here today for a hearing on Blue Cross's rate requests for the individual and small group markets. This is the third year that this rate hearing has happened virtually as we continue to feel the disruptive effects of COVID-19. Blue Cross has played a stabilizing role in Vermont's healthcare system throughout the pandemic. We help providers stay solvent with cash advances. We offer payment flexibility to keep people insured, and we adapted our policies and programs to make sure our members could access care. We approach the pandemic the same way we approach our everyday work by focusing on our commitment to Vermont and to our role as a partner with regulators and providers pursuing a common objective to bring high quality, affordable health care to Vermonters. Our rate requests in these markets this year reflect this commitment. We continue to commit paying direct pandemic costs out of our reserves rather than charging for those costs and premiums. And we are not requesting an increase to the contribution reserves above the 1.5% that we have consistently asked for in our past several filings. We have requested rates that will allow us to pay our members' claims and remain solvent. And although we are requesting a rate increase this year, it is significantly less than what our competitor in these markets is requesting. Much of what I just said and what you're here today is going to sound familiar. 
Blue Cross has taken the same approach to developing its rates this year as it has in the past. We've been guided by the same regulatory requirements, including that the rates are fair and affordable, that they promote quality care and access to care, and that they protect insurer solvency. We've applied the same actuarial standards and taken largely the same approach to our modeling forecasts. And we've maintained a consistent approach that will keep our administrative costs and reserves within a reasonable range for 2023, as the board's actuaries at Lewis and Ellis and the Department of Financial Regulation have agreed. But obviously some things have changed from last year. Last year, we requested a decrease in rates for small group plans and an increase for individual plans that was largely offset by federal subsidies. This year, we are requesting significant increases in both markets. So what, what is different? And I think the answer is clear and will not come as a surprise to anyone here is the cost of healthcare. That's the elephant in the room today. More than 90% of the premium payments that Blue Cross receives go to paying providers for the care they deliver to Vermonters. And although we will have some detailed actuarial discussions today, this part of the math is very simple. When we have to pay more for care, we have to charge more for cost, for coverage. Um, Increased healthcare costs, specifically very large expected hospital budget increases and the continually rising cost of specialty pharmaceuticals are the key drivers of our requested rate increases this year. Through the testimony of Blue Cross's Chief Actuary Paul Schultz and Chief Financial Officer Ruth Green, we will show how Blue Cross has worked hard both in its reform efforts and its rate development to account for and to the extent possible to mitigate the impact of these costs. I would like to emphasize some of the key points that you will hear today uh, from Mr. Schultz and Ms. Green about our rate requests. First, our requested rates are actuarially supported. You will hear Mr. Schultz explain how Blue Cross developed its rate request for this year. He will explain the various components of the proposed rates, how they were calculated, and how various state and federal regulatory requirements affect those components. We will also explain the direct and unavoidable impact that the cost of healthcare has on our rate requests. And you will also hear how much of our actuarial analysis is undisputed. The board's actuaries at Lewis and Ellis have recommended that the board accept most components of our rate requests, including our administrative costs and contribution to reserves. And where Lewis and Ellis has recommended modifications, we have largely agreed with those recommendations, including by considering recent hospital budget submissions. For its part, the Department of Financial Regulation has concluded that the range of surplus we have targeted in our proposed rates is, quote, reasonable and necessary for the protection of policyholders, and that any downward adjustments to the filings rate components that are not actuarially supported will reduce our surplus and negatively impact our solvency. We do have a disagreement with one of uh, l &E's recommendations, uh, which is that the medical utilize, utilization trend assumption in our rate request should be reduced. As Mr. Schultz explained in his supplementary pre-file testimony and we'll cover again today, we do not believe there is actuarial support for making that reduction. The second theme that you'll hear in today's testimony is that Blue Cross has been committed to keeping rates as affordable as possible. We recognize the difficulties that the cost of healthcare creates for individuals and businesses in Vermont. We've continued to partner with the state in ongoing healthcare reform efforts and to design and implement innovative prog programming that both reduces costs and makes it easier for Vermonters to navigate the healthcare system and access high quality care. And the final theme you will hear is how Blue Cross has worked hard to accurately forecast its risk based capital for the coming plan year. This will ensure that we maintain sufficient but not redundant surplus to protect our solvency, to be prepared for future disruptions, and to continue paying COVID-related costs from our reserves. Mr. Schultz will explain how Blue Cross's actuarial team developed a more useful and complete forecasting model for risk-based capital and why they did so. And Ms. Green will explain how Blue Cross has committed to maintaining a contribution to reserves percentage of 1.5% for 2023 even though the pressure of rising costs could certainly justify increasing that percentage. But thank you. We urge the board to approve our final requested rates to ensure Blue Cross's ability to continue providing Vermonters with access to affordable and high quality care. Mr. Battles, uh, would the HCA 
like to make an opening statement? Yes, thank you very much, Mr. Barber. Uh, Mr. Chair and members of the board, I'm Jay Angoff representing the HCA. Um, the board has been, since the enactment of the Affordable Care Act and since the implementation of the current system, the board has been particularly understanding and compassionate and helpful to Blue Cross. Every year, the board has approved the rate increase for Blue Cross. In the past two years, uh, the board has been particularly helpful to Blue Cross. Last year, despite the fact that Blue Cross had had its best year, certainly since the new system came online, the board approved the 12.4% rate increase. The year before that, despite the fact of an ill-advised investment that reduced uh, Blue Cross's RBC by 163 points, the board took no uh, punitive action against Blue Cross and to the contrary, allowed a, in effect, allowed Blue Cross to have additional money to replace the money that uh, that investment uh, loss had uh, had caused. How did Blue? How has Blue Cross reacted to the board's largesse over the past six or seven years? It has sued the board. Last year, Blue Cross sued the board because it said the board was compelled to grant a 1.5% CTR to Blue Cross, and it only granted a 1% uh, C CTR allowance. I found that odd. On the other hand, the pending lawsuit raises some very significant questions. And I think it's something that, that should be taken seriously and can and will affect the discretion that the board has in the future. What that lawsuit attempts to do is to severely limit the board's discretion so that the board, in effect, must take the guidance of l &E rather than the other way around. What the what, what, what the, the, the issue that the, uh, that the lawsuit highlights really is something that uh, both the board and l and &E and the HCA, and I, I certainly blame myself for part of this, have disregarded the past several years. And that is this. There is no such thing as one rate that is not inadequate, excessive, or unfairly discriminatory. Rather, there is a range. There is a range of rates, a zone of reasonableness. Within that zone, lots of rates are not excessive, not inadequate, not unfairly discriminatory. What we have all been doing in the past several years is to try to find it, it, it is to find try to find a rate that fits that standard. There is no one rate. There's a broad range of rates. And what it's too late uh, to fix the past, but it's not too late to not too late to fix the future. What the board, in my opinion, ought to be doing is asking L and E, give us a range. Give us a range of reasonable rates. Give us a range of reasonable assumptions in connection with each element. And within that range, then the board can exercise its discretion to determine what number to accept within that range. What Blue Cross wants is the opposite. They want, they want, they take the position that once the actuaries say, here's one number, the board must accept that number. It can choose between Blue Cross's number and l &E's, but that's it. The board itself has no discretion. So what I'll be doing throughout the day is asking Blue Cross's witnesses, what is the range of reasonable assumptions? It may well be that the assumption that Blue Cross has made is reasonable, but there are many other reasonable assumptions. 
the importance, the, the reason that a range is so important is that this is an inherently uncertain business. Nobody can predict the future. Actuaries can't predict, can't predict the future. They do the best they can, but they can't predict the future. So there's got to be a range of reasonableness. In addition, because of the coronavirus, there's even less certainty today than there has been in the past. So I think we, we sometimes get the illusion, you know, actuaries, when they do their, their uh, analysis, sometimes they carry out factors to four decimal points. And we get the illusion of precision when we look at those numbers, but there's no, there's no precision. Again, it's got to be a range. I was disturbed last week when, and I'm no expert on the hospital rate setting process, and I apologize if I get something wrong here, but I believe after the three months of back and forth between l &E and the HCA and the and Blue Cross and letters back and forth and objections, and finally uh, answers to questions. After all that, last week, Blue Cross asked for an additional 22% increase, not 22 points, but 22% above the original increase, based on its belief that the board would approve hospital rate increases in August. And if I've got that right, to me, that seems wrong for three reasons. Number one, I don't think it's proper. I don't think it's proper under the either under the statute or under the regs for Blue Cross to come in at the last minute after there's been intense analysis of its rate filing and say, oh, by the way, we want 22% more. There's just not time, there's just not time to, to, uh, to evaluate that. Second, it's just unsporting. We've been at this for three months, and then they come in the last minute and ask for 22% more. Third, and this is, the most, this is the most significant, it seems to me it's horribly bad policy because what it would, to approve what Blue Cross has asked for, because by doing so, you would not just be approving Blue Cross's rate increase, you'd also, as a practical matter, be approving the hospital rate increase, which you're supposed to be evaluating next, next month, and that all gets locked in, and it becomes part of trend, and it becomes inflationary year after year. So I'd urge the, the board very strongly to uh, disregard Blue Cross's uh, request for a, an additional 22%, and at a very, very minimum, if the board is to consider it, to wait until after the board acts on the hospital rate increase before taking any action as to what Blue Cross has requested. Thank you, Mr. Chair and, Mr. and uh, board members, and I look forward to the hearing. Okay, now we'll move to this testimony. Mr. Battles, please call your first witness. Hi. Thank you. Mike, you haven't sworn the witnesses in yet. I'll do that when Paul shows up. There we go. Uh, thank you, Mr. Barber. Blue Cross calls Paul Schultz. Mr. Schultz, I'm going to swear you in at this point. If you could please raise your right hand. You solemnly swear that the evidence you shall give relative to the cause under consideration shall be the truth, the whole truth. Uh, and nothing but the truth, so help you God. You. This is your Mr. Battles. Thank you. Can you please state your name and your employment for the record? Hi, I'm Paul Schultz, Chief Actuary for Blue Cross Blue Shield of Vermont. Did you prepare and submit pre-filed testimony in this proceeding, Mr. Schultz? Yes, I did. Uh, will you please identify your pre-filed testimony uh, by the exhibit number in the exhibit binder? Sure. My um, 
July 1st pre-file testimony can be found at Exhibit 21, and my July 11th supplemental pre-file testimony is Exhibit 23. Was all of the testimony contained in Exhibits 21 and 23 true and correct to the best of your knowledge at the time you submitted it? Yes. As you sit here today, is all the testimony contained in those two exhibits true and correct to the best of your knowledge? Yes, it is. Thank you. Um, were you responsible for preparing the Blue Cross 2023 individual and small group rate files for the subject of this proceeding? I was. The filings were prepared under my supervision, and I'm fully familiar with all of the contents thereof, and as well as the rate development that underlies the filings. Uh, and did you certify those filings? Yes, I did. At the time of filing, I certified that they are in compliance with all relevant actuarial standards of practice and with all applicable uh, state and federal law. And that uh, certification holds true today. Thank you. And were you also responsible for preparing all the information and responses that Blue Cross has provided during the course of this proceeding? Uh, to the questions that have been posed by the Green Mountain Care Board's actuary, Lewis Nellis? Yes, that material was also prepared under my supervision, and I'm fully familiar with, with all of that content as well. And are you also uh, familiar with the information and responses that Blue Cross has provided uh, during this proceeding to the questions that were posed by the Green Mountain Care Board itself and uh, the Office of the Healthcare Advocate? Yes, I'm familiar with that information and I can speak in depth to several of the topics. On that note, uh, can you, what were your objectives when you uh, developed the rates reflected in the filings? Sure, our objectives were to develop rates that cover the costs of healthcare in 2023 for our members, um, while providing for the minimum necessary contribution to policyholder reserves that keeps Blue Cross on a trajectory toward the solvency position that is mandated by our solvency regulator, the Depart Department of Financial Regulation. Uh, and at the same time, we wanted to develop rates that are competitive in the marketplace. We did this by using assumptions that are reasonable individually and in the aggregate, and that comply with all state uh, and federal rules and instructions, as well as the relevant actuarial standards of practice. Uh, one of our goals was not to develop the set of rates that represents the maximum reasonable rates actuarially. Um, can you, will you please summarize the proposed rates contained in the initial filings? Yes, as initially filed, we proposed uh, rates that would reflect an average increase of 12.3% in the individual market and 12.5% in the small group market. And just to clarify, those are the rates that were proposed in the initial filings before accounting for Lewis analysis recommendations or the impact of hospital budgets. Yes, that's correct. Uh, please summarize the key drivers that resulted in the rates proposed in the filings. The key drivers uh, of the rate increases were the increasing use of specialty pharmaceuticals. Uh, as well as the increased prices that are demanded by hospitals and other providers. Um, especially pharmaceuticals uh, are responsible for an increase of 3.4% in the individual market and 2.4% in the small group market. Uh, it is essential that Blue Cross provides access to these high cost drugs that improve the quality of life and in many cases save lives. Um, but in order to provide that access, it's necessary to include those very high costs within our rates. Uh, this is an example of prioritizing access to care over affordability. Uh, in terms of the prices charged by providers, those were responsible for an 8.0% increase in the individual market and 7.8% of the increase in the small group market. And that's before consideration of the hospital budgets that were submitted on July 1st to the board. Um, once we incorporate those hospital budgets, both of those figures uh, increase by about 2.5%, meaning that over 10 points of the increase in both dockets of the final proposed rates that you'll hear today uh, is due to increases in, in prices that will be paid to 
hospitals and providers. Uh, Blue Cross did continue its work to mitigate these rate increases uh, through its continued engagement with Vermont Blue Rx and through a new partnership with Civica Rx, Blue Cross has been able to deliver 1.3% premium relief in both dockets. Can you please describe in, in general terms how the filings were prepared? Sure. Um, generally, we project, we from recent experience, uh, we project that experience forward to 2023 using generally accepted actuarial standards of practice. Um, in its broadest terms, we apply actuarial science to project the claim costs, taxes and fees, and cost of insurance necessary to cover the costs of healthcare uh, for our members in 2023. And then we calculate premiums that are sufficient to cover all of those costs. Before attempting to project claims costs and costs of insurance, is it necessary to rebase uh, Blue Cross's prior rate calculations? And if so, could you explain what rebasing means in this context? Uh, we actually don't have to rebase any prior calculations. This year's calculations are completely independent from last year's calculations. Um, what we do, however, is as long as the experience is credible, we update the experience base to use the most recent 12 months that are available. Uh, credible in this sense is an actuarial term that means that a population is sufficiently large to develop uh, projections on its own merits as opposed to blending with some sort of manual rate. Uh, in this case, we're using actual calendar 2021 experience to direct project forward to 2023. And so just to clarify, so when you're talking about rebasing in this context, you're talking about using the actual 2021 claims data as opposed to changing prior calculations. Correct. Last year's development used the 2020 uh, as the base period for, for claim. Well, last year's development, in fact, used 2019 because 2020 was deemed to be not credible because of the pandemic. This year, we're updating to use 2021 as the base period. Uh, did you make any adjustments to actual 2021 experience? We did. COVID continued to have a, an impact on uh, utilization of healthcare services in 2021. Uh, so we did a few things. We, we uh, did a detailed analysis of claims by service category and reached a conclusion that care that was deferred from 2020 into 2021 was offset by continued deferral of care during 2021 as new COVID waves hit. Um, the exception to that was for certain claims categories for which care cannot be deferred, it can only be foregone. Those include emergency room, urgent care, ambulance, flu, and pneumonia. For those categories, we assumed that the 2023 level of utilization would revert to pre-pandemic levels. Um, the other adjustment we made was to account for a cyber attack that took place on the University of Vermont Health Network systems in October of 2020. And as a result of that attack, a good deal of care that had been scheduled for the fourth quarter of 2020 was deferred and rescheduled for the first quarter of 2021. Uh, so we adjusted 2021 downward in, the, in that case um, to remove those extra services that were originally scheduled for 2020. In combination, those adjustments that I've just discussed uh, had an upward effect on 2021 base experience of a little less than half a percent. And can you quantify the impact of updating to use uh, 2021 experience? Sure, uh, including a favorable risk adjustment transfer result, uh, the impact of updating to the most recent experience was a 0.1% decrease in the small group market and a 0.6% increase in the individual market. In your last response, you mentioned a risk adjustment transfer. What is a risk adjustment transfer? Sure. Uh, so when the ACA was enacted, it included three federal programs that were designed to encourage issuers to uh, cover all Americans, not just those who were in good health. The only permanent of those three programs is the risk adjustment program, where in any given market, the issuer who has uh, tends to ensure the healthier lives 
provides a payment to the issuer who ensures the less healthy lives. Um, this is done to, to in a, basically the goal is to uh, bring equilibrium to premiums so that issuers who cover the, the folks with the greater healthcare needs are not punished uh, for the choice to cover those folks. Specific to the Vermont market, individuals with greater healthcare needs overwhelmingly choose Blue Cross coverage. So this results in a payment from MVP to Blue Cross that in recent years has exceeded $20 million. The entirety of those funds are directly incorporated into these rates. Can you please describe what allowed claims costs are and generally how you projected them? Sure, allowed claim costs are the total uh, cost of health care uh, for members, including member cost sharing. Uh, we project that by examining 2021 experience, making the adjustments that I discussed earlier, and then projecting that experience forward to 2023. The two primary components of that projection are increases in the utilization and cost of services, which uh, are encompassed by the trend assumption, and changes in the population itself. The covered population may likely be different in 2023. And those projections are part of the population morbidity assumptions. Uh, we also take into account any sort of regulatory changes that take place between 2021 and 2023, and we factor those into the projections as well. How do the uh, allowed claims flow into the premium? So we then split the allowed claims into its component pieces. Those would be uh, claims that are paid by Blue Cross to providers in the provision of care, and then member cost sharing. The former category goes directly into premium, uh, whereas the latter category does not. And the way we split those things out is through a series of what's called allowable adjustments. Uh, to the projection. These include a paid to allowed adjustment that is based on a standard population and benefit Richmond adjustments based on federal factors uh, that account for the fact that members who are on richer coverage tend to use more services. Uh, paid claims, that is the, the portion of claims that are paid by Blue Cross to providers for providing care to our members accounts for over 90% of the premium. What is a medical loss ratio or MLR? Uh, medical loss ratio is a federally defined quantity that reflects the total of clinical services and quality initiatives as a portion of premiums. And what is the MLR uh, for the proposed rates that Blue Cross has filed? As initially filed, the proposed rates included an MLR of 90.2% for the individual plans and 92.3% for the small group plans. And is there a, a federal requirement uh, for MLR? Yes, the federal and state requirement is a minimum of 80% MLR. So the figures that I quoted, both over 90% are well above the federal minimum requirement. And what is the cost of insurance? Uh, the cost of insurance is the uh, the total amount of money it takes for an insurance company to provide the infrastructure and operations necessary to help members navigate the healthcare system and to pay claims as they arise. Uh, in our case, the cost of insurance consists of two main pieces. Those would be administrative charges and the contribution to policyholder reserves. Please explain how you projected the cost of insurance in preparing the filings. Sure. So for administrative costs, we again started with 2021 base experience. Uh, we then made a few adjustments. We removed any one-time charges that were not likely to repeat in 2023. Um, we also made an adjustment to decrease the amount of overhead that is allocated to the ACA line of business. From that baseline, we projected forward using a modest 4% inflation assumption from 2021 to 2023. And then to that amount, we added the cost of two new services that we're providing to our members. Um, we are allowing members to pay premium using a credit or a debit card. And so the transaction fees uh, associated with that have been added into the administrative costs. 
Uh, additionally, starting in 2022, we've taken over billing from Vermont Health Connect. So we've added the, the costs of uh, those operations into the administrative fees as well. Um, in terms of contribution to policyholder reserves, you know, Blue Cross has to comply with all uh, Vermont regulation, and that includes uh, maintaining a quantity called risk-based capital, or RBC, um, which is a measure of a company's solvency at a certain point in time. Uh, we need to maintain that quantity within a certain range that has been ordered by the Department of Financial Regulation. In order to do that, we need to file a uh, nominal CTR of 1.5% in these filings. Um, but we've also made ple a pledge that we will continue to pay for direct COVID costs out of reserves. Um, so we projected those costs for 2023, and we removed that amount from the nominal CTR to calculate a net CTR. And that, that number is 0.8% in the individual market, 0.7% in the small group market. Uh, to that, we add another 0.2% only in the individual market for something called the cost of bad debt. And that reflects the uncollectible premiums that we've consistently seen in that market because of the grace periods that exist uh, in the individual market. Um, in total, our cost of insurance comes to 8.7% of premium in the individual market and 7.4% of premium in the small group market. And that number is less than half of the maximum 20% cost of insurance that's allowable under state and federal law. Did you include a profit in developing the rates for these files? No, Blue Cross is a local Vermont nonprofit company. There is no profit in any of our rates. Uh, you identified trend and morbidity as uh, two of the most important assumptions in figuring out how to project your 2023 claims costs from your 2021 experience. Uh, you first explain how you address trend in the filings. Uh, sure. So for medical trend, we take a look at two components, utilization trend, which we define as both the number of services and the mix of those services and unit cost trend, which is the increase in price for any one given service. Uh, similarly, for retail pharmacy, uh, we took a look at utilization and unit cost for non-specialty medications. For specialty medications, because they're quite low uh, in terms of utilization, but very, very high in terms of cost, we combine those things and just look at the total costs for specialty medications. And will you please describe how you calculated the medical unit cost trend? Sure. So we uh, separate the providers um, of medical services into three categories. There are the hospitals that are part of the Green Mountain Care Board budget review process. There are other hospitals and providers with whom Blue Cross contracts directly. And then there are uh, out of area providers who are accessed and contracted through the blue card network. For those latter two categories, we examine recent experience uh, and flavor that with an understanding of any ongoing contract negotiations to develop our assumption. For the hospitals that are part of the Green Mountain Care Board process, we started with an assumption that the board would approve budgets this year that match the budgets, the commercial rate increases that were approved for hospitals last year. Um, but we amended that in certain cases. For the hospitals that requested a mid-year rate increase in early 2022, we assumed that the portion of that mid-year increase that was denied by the board uh, would become incorporated into their uh, annual budget request. Ultimately, when you put all that together, uh, we, we calculated at the time of filing a 6.9% medical unit cost trend. And will you describe how you calculated the medical utilization trend? Sure. We examined uh, several years of recent experience and applied a variety of statistical uh, methods to assess that experience. When a number of these calculations yield a similar result, we can feel comfortable that the underlying trend assumption uh, for historical trend is pretty solid. 
starting with that baseline, we will make adjustments for any sort of one-time uh, events that will have uh, will have affected trend in the past. And we also consider how future trends might be different from recent past experience. Um, ultimately, for medical utilization trend, we landed on an assumption of the 1.9% in the individual market, 2.0% in the small group market. Both of those numbers consist of the same set of underlying trend assumptions, and those specifically are 1.5% for facility utilization trend, 8.5% for professional mental health services, 1.0% for other professional services, and 3.6% for pharmaceuticals that are accessed through the medical benefit because they're dispensed in a hospital or a provider's office. Uh, please explain the pharmacy cost and utilization trends reflected in the filings. Sure. So again, for these, we take a, a close look at recent experience and apply statistical methods to that um, to develop a baseline. To that, we incorporate any cost savings that we expect to arise by from brand drugs losing their patent expiration uh, between now and the, and the projection period. Um, we also examine the specialty drug pipeline. Almost the entirety of the pharmacy pi pipeline at this point uh, consists of specialty pharmaceuticals. So we, we take a close look at those and make sure that we're adjusting properly for any new specialty drugs that will be coming on the market. Uh, ultimately, after contract changes, we are using a pharmacy trend of 13.4%. Um, above, you mentioned that population morbidity is another key assumption driving your uh, 2023 projected claims costs. Can you explain how you address population morbidity in your filings? Sure. So we, we take a look at the way that our uh, population is, ex is expected to change from 2021 to 2023, and we, we develop a number of assumptions in that regard. Um, one component of it is, is we look at the individuals who have disenrolled from Blue Cross coverage since the experience period, and we make adjustments uh, by essentially removing their claims from the analysis. Um, we also take a look at how average cost sharing uh, will change from the experience period to the projection period based upon the plans that members chose in 2022. Um, and we, we make adjustments uh, to the, to the um, paid to allowed ratio and to the utilization based upon that cost sharing. And finally, we, we examine how our base population is just going to naturally change over time as people get older newborns arrive to join the population, and some members hit Medicare eligibility or otherwise decide to retire and leave the population. Um, so we, you know, we, we put all of those things together and the, the impact of the population morbidity assumption specifically was a minus 0.3% decrease for individuals and a, and a I'm sorry, a 0.3% decrease for individuals, I should be more clear and a 1.4% decrease for small groups. Uh, you explained what a, a risk adjustment transfer was uh, a few moments ago. Do uh, risk adjustment play a role in developing your population morbidity assumptions? Uh, risk adjustment is uh, closely related to the population morbidity assumptions. Uh, it's probably more accurate to say that the population morbidity assumptions played a role in our risk adjustment projection. Um, and we developed that projection using information that was available to us at the time of filing. Uh, one key assumption is that we assumed the 2023 population would be very similar to the 2022 population in terms of age and risk profile. Uh, thank you. Uh, now I ask you to turn to exhibit 13 in the exhibit finder. Sorry, Ben, that's 13? Um, yes. Okay, got it. And uh, if you please identify that exhibit uh, for the board. Sure, uh, this, these are our responses to a set of questions that were posed by Lewis and Ellis uh, on June 20th. Uh, and if you look at uh, page, uh, beginning on page five and going through 
uh, to page nine of that exhibit. Uh, could you identify what that is? Um, yes, this is a description of our um, of the RBC modeling that, that we performed uh, in conjunction with these filings. And you're familiar with uh, with that modeling? Yes, I am. That was performed under my supervision. Okay. Um, could you explain the term stochastic modeling? Sure. So when we're doing financial projections, there are uh, a couple different ways that we can do that. Um, there's deterministic modeling and there's stochastic modeling. Uh, in deterministic modeling, you determine specific values uh, for your key assumptions like membership or medical trend or investment return. And using those uh, assumptions as input, you can then calculate uh, the financial result that you're trying to project, in this case, RBC at a particular point in time. Uh, stochastic modeling is similar in that you still define a most likely result for each of the assumptions, but you also define a range of likely results uh, around that most likely answer. Uh, you then run a huge number of iterations of the model. We used 10,000 and you let the model itself choose at random a value for each assumption within that range you've defined and within a probability distribution that you've also defined within that range. Can you uh, give an example? Uh, sure. So in a deterministic model, we might assume that uh, we expect 2% membership growth uh, into the future. For a stochastic model, you might instead define that as a range from 0% to 4% growth and a bell-shaped normal distribution within that range. Uh, and using those assumptions, 2% is still your most likely result, but the, the stochastic model simultaneously gives you sensitivity to a, a broad array of other results um, that also uh, you know, fall within your defined range and probability distribution. Uh, and in your, your prior answer, you indicated that uh, Blue Cross had used a stochastic model for these filings. Uh, can you just confirm that and also, uh, is this the first year that Blue Cross has done so? Yes, that's correct. It's, uh, we did use a stochastic model. Uh, we, we built and used it. And uh, this is the first year that we, uh, that we did employ a stochastic model. Uh, we, we did that because we observed that our simplified deterministic model that we used last year gave a false sense of precision uh, for the RBC result at a certain point in time. So in developing the stochastic approach, we had two goals in mind. One is that we wanted to account for all of the major drivers of RBC, and that includes investment return, uh, pension impact, uh, as well as the impact of results from other lines of business than the ACA business. Um, our other goal was to enhance the level of information that we were providing our regulators by giving them a range of most likely results for RBC, um, rather than simply a point estimate that gives no real sense of the possible fluctuation in RBC. Uh, you talked about ranges and probability distributions for stochastic assumptions. Are those listed at page six of exhibit 13? Uh, yes, they are. Uh, and did Lewis and Ellis offer an opinion uh, with respect to Blue Cross's use of stochastic modeling? Uh, they did. They reviewed our assumptions, and their opinion was that they are reasonable inputs for projecting 2023 RBC. Um, and they also opined that the range of possible RBC positions and resulting likelihoods from our stochastic modeling is reasonable. Uh, I'm going to now ask you to take a look at Exhibit 15 in the binder. Okay. Got it. Okay. Can you identify what that exhibit is? Yes. This exhibit are our responses to questions posed uh, also on June 20th by Lewis and Ellis uh, on behalf of the Office of the Healthcare Advocate. Um, okay. And uh, if you would look to Turn to page two and read the request at the bottom of page two. Okay. Um, the request is to quantify the impact on Blue Cross's projected year-end 2022 
and year end 2023 RBC of any multi year fee guarantees Blue Cross has provided to self funded customers. Could you summarize Blue Cross's response to that question? Um, sure. So, uh, large self funded customers typically place their business out to bid through a formal RFP request for proposal process. Um, those RFPs almost invariably demand that a bidder must provide a multi-year guarantee of their fee. Um, if Blue Cross were not willing to provide these multi-year guarantees, we would be uh, immediately eliminated from contention in these RFP processes. So to assess the, the impact on uh, RBC of these fee guarantees, we examined the RBC um, with and without these customers. And we found that um, projected year end 2022 RBC would be approximately 85 percentage points higher in their absence and 50 percentage points higher at year end 2023. If RBC would be higher without these customers, does it follow that ACA rates would be lower if Blue Cross hadn't sold this business? Uh, no, just the opposite, in fact. Um, because of the larger membership base, uh, we were able to allocate fewer fixed costs to the ACA business in these filings, and that has the impact of reducing premiums by about 2%. Um, the temporary RBC impact, while meaningful, is not of a sufficient magnitude to compel Blue Cross to divert from its uh, usual process of filing the long-term 1.5% contribution to reserves that allows us to stay within the DFR mandated range. Um, so looking at those things in conjunction, we can conclude that this large self-funded business has the impact of reducing premiums in the ACA market by about 2%. Uh, you mentioned a temporary RBC impact. Can you please elaborate on what you mean by that? Yes. So uh, statutory accounting rules require that where we have expected losses on multi-year contracts, we recognize all of those losses immediately rather than as they actually occur. So when we were doing this assessment, um, you know, the way we did it was to assume that all of that self-funded business uh, essentially goes away in 2023. What that does from an accounting perspective is it immediately releases the entirety of those accrued losses over the life of the contract. So what we have is an immediate bump in RBC, and that's the 85 percentage points that I talked about. Um, over time, as we approach the end of those fee guarantees, that bump dwindles uh, back to sort of its baseline level. So we can see that as we go from 85 points in 2022 to 50 points at year end 2023. And in fact, by year end 2025, when most of these fee guarantees will have expired, the RBC impact is in fact neutral. Is individual and small group business subsidizing these multi-year fee guarantees for self-funded large group business? No. As I've testified in the absence of this large, large self-funded uh, business on fee guarantees, uh, ACA rates would in fact be higher. Uh, it therefore cannot logically follow that the ACA business is subsidizing the self-funded business. Uh, now I'm gonna ask you a, a few questions about the analysis that Lewis and Ellis uh, prepared for uh, the filings in these markets. Um, have you had a chance to review their uh, actuarial opinions, which are exhibits 17 and 18 in the binder? Yes, I have. Uh, I'm going to ask you to turn to page 26 of Exhibit 17. Got it. Um, and uh, direct your attention to the recommendations section of the report. And regarding the second through fifth recommendations, does your supplemental pre-file testimony uh, which you previously indicated was uh, at Exhibit 23. Uh, does that testimony still reflect Blue Cross's position with respect to those recommendations of Alani? It does. Blue Cross agrees that each of those recommendations should be made. Thank you. And, and what is Blue Cross's position regarding the recommendation um, 
to consider updated hospital budget information, which is on uh, page 23 of our newsletter. Um, we, we agree that with uh, Lewis and Ellis's recommendation that the updated uh, information regarding unit costs uh, trends that is available in the July 1 hospital budget submissions uh, should be used to update the assumed unit cost trends in this filing. And have you estimated the impact of the submitted hospital budgets on these filings? Yes, we have. Uh, we'll now ask you to look at Exhibit 29, which is one of the exhibits that was circulated by email uh, after the binder was filed. Um, and if you could uh, identify what that exhibit is. Uh, yes, this is our response to a Lewis and Ellis inquiry um, to quantify the impact of hospital budgets on rates. How did you go about performing this analysis? Um, we examined the hospital budget narratives that are available on the Green Mountain Care Board website, and we extracted from those narratives each hospital's commercial rate increase request. Uh, we then plugged those requests into our unit cost trend spreadsheet and allowed the results to flow through to premiums. Uh, what we found is that um, if the hospital budget requests were approved as requested, the impact on rates would be an upward uh, adjustment of about three and a half percent in each docket. And uh, sorry to, to jump around, but I'm now going to direct your attention uh, back to exhibit 20, uh, page 26 of exhibit 17. Um, okay. Um, and this again, we're looking at the re recommendations section of the LE report. Uh, and regarding the recommendation to reduce medical utilization trend. Uh, does your supplemental pre-file testimony at pages three through nine of Exhibit 23 uh, still accurately reflect Blue Cross's position with respect to this item? Yes, we disagree with this recommendation. Uh, in my opinion, there is no actuarial justification for reducing our filed medical utilization trend. Uh, furthermore, um, our filed farm facility utilization trend uh, is already at the low end of the reasonable range for those assumptions, and any downward adjustment to that assumption would result uh, in a facility trend that is below the reasonable range for facility utilization trend and is therefore inadequate. I'm now going to direct your attention to another one of the uh, uh, to exhibit what has been marked as Exhibit 30, which is another one that was circulated by email, uh, and this has not yet been entered into evidence. I'd like to ask you a couple questions about this document. Okay. Uh, could you first identify what this document is? Uh, yes, this document is an exhibit that shows the impact of the l and &E recommendations on premium and also demonstrates uh, a simplified development of the final Blue Cross proposed uh, rate increases in these dockets. Uh, did you oversee the preparation of this document? Yes, I did. Uh, does this chart accurately portray and reflect the impact of LNE's recommendations on Blue Cross's final proposed rates? It does. And uh, will this chart assist you in uh, helping us understand your testimony about Blue Cross's final proposed rates? Yes, it will. Uh, I would like to offer exhibit 30 into evidence. Any objections, Mr. No objection. Admitted. Thank you. Um, and just a couple more questions about this document. So uh, could you explain, you identify where in the document we can see Blue Cross's final proposed rates? Um, yes, there's a, a, a column that is labeled as such, Blue Cross Proposed, and you can see the final proposed uh, average rate increases highlighted in boxes at the bottom of each of the two tables. Uh, and, and I see a note at, at the bottom of each table uh, which says percentage changes are multiplicative and may not sum to the average rate increase. So I just wanted to just explain what that means for us. <laughs> 
Sure. Um, and this is a note that Lewis and Ellis typically includes in, in their presentation as well. And that's, you know, each of these impacts on rates uh, is independent of the others. Um, and you, you can't just sort of add down the column to get the total rate uh, increase or rate impact. You have to multiply each one together. They're intended to be multiplied together as opposed to added together. Uh, that's what that note's intending to convey. Uh, okay, and, and then, I'm gonna add, please summarize the proposed rates as modified uh, according to Lewis and Ellis's recommendations. Sure, so if we change the rates in accordance with all of the Lewis and Ellis recommendations, uh, we land on an average rate increase of 11.2% in the individual market and 11.6% in the small group market. Both of those figures are before considering the impact of hospital budget submissions. And how does Blue Cross's final rate request, which you just described in Exhibit 30, uh, how does that differ from the figures you just noted? Sure, it, it differs in two ways. One, because we disagree with the L&E recommendation to reduce our filed medical utilization trend. We do not include the impact of that recommendation in our calculation. Uh, the second way it's different is that we've actually quantified the impact of the hospital budgets that were submitted on July 1st. Does the impact of new hospital budget information on the final rate request match what was previously discussed in Exhibit 29? No, it does not. Uh, it differs in two ways, uh, both of which reduce the impact that we showed on Exhibit 29. Uh, first, we assumed that the Green Mountain Care Board would take action in these hospital budget uh, uh, reviews that is similar to the action they've taken in recent years. So we've reduced those uh, commercial rate increases by 1% to reflect that Green Mountain Care Board action. The second thing that we've done is that we've incorporated the final contracts for certain uh, non-Vermont hospitals uh, where negotiations had still been ongoing at the time of filing. Again, both of those changes reduced the impact of the hospital budget submissions. And just so uh, I know you addressed this a moment ago, but just to be clear, what are the final average rate increases Blue Cross is requesting in these documents? Sure, the, the final average rate increases are 14, an average 14.9% in the individual market and an average 15.4% in the small group market. Uh, I now like to turn what has uh, been marked uh, as Exhibit 31. Okay. Uh, and can you explain what this document is? Uh, yes, Exhibit 31 demonstrates the final proposed uh, rates on a plan-by-plan -plan basis in both the individual and small group markets. It also shows the, the uh, average rate, in, well, it shows the rate increase from prior rates for each of those plans as well. Did you oversee the preparation of this document? Yes. Uh, and does this chart accurately portray and reflect the final, final premiums for specific plans in the individual and small markets that Blue Cross is requesting? Yes. Uh, I, I would offer Exhibit 31 into evidence as well. Uh, yeah, Mr. Chair, I'm going to object. As I said in my opening, I don't think it's proper to be uh, for Blue Cross to be uh, at this point proposing an additional. What I said was it uh, the additional rate increase that brings them up to where they are now instead of where they were during this whole proceeding. So I just don't think it's proper for the board to be considering this issue at this time, after the board acts on the hot proposed hospital rate increases that if the board wanted to consider this issue that would be the time to do it not not now because i think it has a, it has a terrible incentivizing effect on what will happen with the board and as i said in my opening i think has an inflationary effect which will be locked in for years and years in the future so i object to the admission of this document and any response to that, Mr. Bow? Yeah, just to briefly respond, you know, what I, what I hear Mr. Angov making is a policy argument for uh, what, you know, whether or not uh, 
is sort of the timing of the different uh, calendars before the board and, and whether we should be including one. I don't hear that as an evidentiary objection or any reason that why that can't come into evidence. I, well, I'd certainly stipulate to it's being admitted if the board doesn't consider it until after the after it acts on the boards on the hospitals uh, increases. Uh, I think we heard a sufficient foundation for the introduction. Um, obviously, the board's going to consider it. Uh, how they, you know, how they consider it in their decision making, I think, is not something we need to resolve here. But uh, it comes into evidence, um, so I'll admit it this time. Thank you. Um, uh, I have a, a few more questions for you, uh, Mr. Schultz. Um, with with respect to the individual individual market, uh, what does the term gross premiums mean? Uh, gross premiums are synonymous with approved rates. And how do you define net premiums in the individual market? Uh, net premiums are gross premiums less any and all available uh, Vermont and federal premium subsidies. On what basis are those federal and Vermont subsidies calculated? Uh, they're calculated on the basis of something called the benchmark plan, which is defined as the second lowest silver plan available on the Vermont exchange. Um, at this time, can you uh, tell us definitively which plan will be the benchmark plan for 2023? No, at, at this time, it's not clear. Um, if a Blue Cross plan is the benchmark plan, what impact would a reduction in gross premiums have on net premiums for subsidized members? We might have lost. Mr. Hearing Officer, uh, uh, it appears that Paul is frozen. It does appear that way. Uh, let's see. I'll send him a note to see if he can leave and rejoin. Why don't we take a five minute break while you're doing that bathroom break and okay. reconvene it? Uh, 917. Sounds good. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, and uh, Mr. Schultz, we were just talking about the benchmark plan. Uh, and so the question I have is, if a Blue Cross plan is the benchmark plan, what impact would a reduction in gross premiums have on net premiums for subsidized members? Uh, every $1 reduction in gross premiums would reduce net premiums by about 10 cents. What happens to the other 90 cents? Uh, the vast majority of that 90 cents would go toward reducing federal subsidies. In other words, it would accrue to the federal government. Um, so just a few more questions for you. Uh, if you could turn to exhibit one in the binder. Okay. Uh, which is the uh, actuarial memorandum, uh, and it turned to page nine of Exhibit One. I'm there. Okay. Um, I'm looking at section 1.8, and uh, does that section discuss the statutory criteria that the board must consider in reviewing the proposed rates? It does. Okay. And could you please read the list of criteria quoted from uh, 8 BSA section 4062A3 uh, that appears at the top of the page, as well as the additional criteria incorporated by the board? Um, sure. When reviewing a proposed rate, the board must consider whether a rate is affordable, promotes quality care, promotes access to health care, protects insurer solvency, and is not unjust, unfair, inequitable, misleading, or contrary to the laws of this state. Uh, the board also expressly incorporated actuarial review standards into the process, tasking itself with determining whether the requested rate is not excessive, inadequate, or unfairly discriminatory. Uh, in your professional opinion, are the final rates proposed by Blue Cross inadequate? They are not. 
Uh, are they excessive? No. Are they unfairly discriminatory? No. Uh, are they reasonable in relation to the benefits provided? Yes, they are. Are they unjust, unfair, inequitable, misleading, or contrary to law? No. Uh, are they affordable while promoting quality care and access to care? Yes, they strike the best balance available among those uh, interrelated and sometimes conflicting criteria. Do they protect Blue Cross's solvency? Yes. And uh, my final question for you, uh, uh, Mr. Schultz, is, is how are you able to conclude that these rates strike an appropriate balance among the affordability, quality, and access criteria? Well, the bulk of these rates, over 90 cents of every dollar, go directly toward paying for the health care of policyholders. Uh, the proposed plans offer access to a broad national network of providers that includes over 97% of the providers in Vermont. Uh, Blue Cross provides world-class customer service and an array of clinical programming that helps members access the healthcare system in a more effective and efficient way. Uh, studies show that the quality of healthcare in Vermont is among the very best nationally. Uh, but there is a cost to access that high quality healthcare. It's the job of actuaries to reasonably project that cost using rules and instructions that have been promulgated by state and federal government and guidelines promulgated by the actuarial profession's own governing bodies. Uh, one of those Vermont rules is community rating, which insists that every policyholder within the community of policyholders must pay the same gross premium. The healthy member who never sees the doctor pays the exact same gross premium as the member who needs a million dollar specialty drug to maintain their quality of life. The board's contracted actuaries, Lewis and Ellis, have reviewed Blue Cross's projections and with a lone point of dissension have, uh, or have been satisfied that Blue Cross followed all of those rules, instructions, and guidelines. In other words, the claim cost component of these premiums fairly represents the cost of accessing high quality health care in Vermont. The only way to make that portion of the premium more affordable is to reduce the actual cost of care that is delivered by hospitals and other providers. So we then have to turn our attention to the remaining pennies on the dollar. What are Vermonters getting for that nine or 10 cents of premium that does not go directly toward paying for their health care? Uh, a portion of that comprises Vermont and federal taxes and fees. These are amounts set by government and cannot be altered by Blue Cross. The balance is what I have termed the cost of insurance, the administrative charges and contributions to policyholder reserves that Blue Cross needs to charge uh, to do the work to help policyholders access the healthcare system and to pay claims when they arise. So how do I know that Blue Cross's cost of insurance is affordable? Well, I, I can determine that in two ways. I can observe that our cost of insurance is less than half of the maximum that's allowable under federal and state law. But even more conclusively, I can observe that Blue Cross activity in the form of Vermont Blue RX, um, Civica RX, payment integrity programming, clinical programming like Better Beginnings, saves more premium dollars through reduced prices, avoided waste, and better outcomes than Blue Cross charges for its cost of insurance. Put simply, Blue Cross's presence in the Vermont market makes healthcare more affordable and those savings have been reflected in the rates before you today. Thank you, Mr. Schultz. And I know I said I was dumb, but I just have one small clarifying question. Yes. Uh, you mentioned nine or 10 cents of the premium going toward uh, taxes and the cost of insurance. Uh, did you mean nine or 10 cents on the dollar of the premium or not? I, I did, thank you. That's a good clarification. I meant nine to 10 cents on the dollar, yes. Thank you. And. Uh, 
uh, although I'll reserve the, with the board's permission, the opportunity for some redirect, but uh, conclude the direct question. Okay, Mr. Angoff, do you have questions for Mr. Schultz? Yes, I do. Thank you, Mr. Hearing Officer. Good morning, Mr. Schultz. How are you doing? Good morning, Mr. Angoff. I'm doing well. How are you today? Good. You were answering a few questions that Mr. Battles asked you about Exhibit 15. Could you please get that back out and turn to page five of that exhibit? I'm sorry. I didn't quite catch the exhibit number. Exhibit 15. 15, which yes. I've been talking to Mr. Battles about. Okay, I am there. Very good. And I just want to make sure that I understand and that the board understands how much people are paying today and what they're paying for and how much they would be paying under the proposed uh, increase. So could you go to uh, exhibit 15, page five, and you see there are two rows there. Go to the, uh, the uh, bottom right uh, box that's headed standard bronze. Do you see that? Yes. Okay, and so am I correct then in understanding for somebody who's making 54,360 or more today, that person is paying $573.09 for your standard bronze uh, policy? Yes. Okay, and, and is, a, is a bronze policy one that uh, has a 70% actuarial value? 60%. Okay. And so a bronze policy is a 60% actuarial value? Yes. Okay. And what is actuarial value? Actuarial value is, is essentially synonymous with paid to allowed ratio. So it's the, the percentage of claims that will be covered by the plan on average for a standard population relative to the, the total claim cost for that standard population. Okay. Then is it fair to say for the average person, the bronze policy pays 60% of his or her costs and the policyholder pays 40%. Yes. Okay. And um, on your standard bronze plan there, what is the deductible? Um, I will have to consult another exhibit that I may or may not be able to read, to be quite honest with you. Uh, the print on some of these gets quite small. Or do you have an estimate? Uh, it's several thousand dollars. $5,000 or so for an individual? Uh, yes. Probably a bit north of that. Sorry? Probably a little little higher than that. $10,000? Uh, not as high as $10,000. Okay, but so, so the, the standard bronze plan then is 60% AV and the stand, with a deductible of somewhere between five and 10000 Is that fair to say? Yes, that's fair to say. Okay, and then so under your originally five filed rates, then that person would pay $646 today. Uh, if, 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 the, if your originally proposed rates were approved. Yes, 646, right. Okay, and then if contrary to my recommendation, the board were to accept the new increases, uh, how much would that, in, the new proposed increases based on the hospital uh, anticipatory uh, Increases. How much would that re raise the rate? For um, five? Good question. Give me a moment to consult Exhibit uh, Thirty One. I will. And we're looking at the standard bronze. So that figure is. Just make sure I have the right thing. Six hundred sixty dollars and seventy five cents. That that would be the price with the new, including the new increase. That's correct. Okay. Okay, so I think I understand that then. Then, then uh, similarly for the standard silver plan, today people are paying, individuals making 54, 360 or more are paying $772.90. Yes. And under the, under the proposal, they'd be paying 855. Yes. And then that would be increased based on your latest increase if the board were to consider that. Yes, and standard silver uh, is now eight hundred seventy-five dollars and twelve cents on the on the final proposed rates. Okay, and do you have an estimate of what, or maybe you know the exact deductible for the standard silver plan? Do you know what that is? 
Don't know that one either. Again, I'd, I'd have to refer to, uh, to binder exhibit two and probably find a magnifying glass somewhere. And I would just object to the extent that calls for speculation, obviously. If Mr. Schultz can answer it, he can. Okay, I'll wait for Mr. Schultz to find it then. <laughs> Standard silver deductibles appear to be yeah, I better find my magnifying glass. That's bronze. Silver, I think that says 4,000, but I reserve the right to find my magnifying glass. Very good. And then the, uh, st the uh, gold plan, that's an 80% actuarial value plan? That's correct. Okay. And so today for that, people are paying $840 and with the, the original increase, they pay 949, and then they're with the uh, if the board were to con consider the latest uh, increment. Yes, that's right. Um, okay, and if you can get your magnifying glass out again, what would the uh, deductible for that be? Uh, let's see. Gold standard looks like $1,400. Okay. And you testified uh, just a little bit earlier that you believe that these rates are affordable, correct? Yes. Okay. D did you do any research to determine whether somebody making 54000 to determine the extent to which someone making $54,360 a year uh, can afford any of these rates? No. Okay. Could you please turn to the rate filing, exhibit one. Are you there? Yes, any page in particular? Yes, page six, please. Page six. Okay. Okay, and you see the, uh, the first two columns of the table there are headed year and member months? Yes. Okay. Um, how long have you been uh, preparing or supervising the preparation of the rate filings for the individual and small group markets in Vermont? Uh, from 2015 till today. Okay. Well, you're a good person to ask this, the following question to them. You see, don't you, that member months in 2016 were 835,541. Yes. And you see in 2021, member months were 411,961. Yes. Okay. And 411,961 is a little less than half of 835,541, correct? I agree. Okay. So, when you were uh, preparing or supervising, by the way, have you prepared all these rate filings yourself? They've been prepared under my supervision. So yes, I've been directly involved with a team of people who, who do all the work. Okay. Um, do you know what a retention analysis is? I have, I, I, I suspect I know what you mean by that, but would you care to define what you mean by it? Yeah. When you, uh, let me ask the question this way. When, when you uh, prepared these rate filings, did you do any, did, did you develop any estimate of the number of people who would uh, stay with the plan, the number of people who would drop it, and the number of people who would come into it? We, we did take that into account in the sense that we know that when the federal health emergency expires, uh, Vermont will recertify uh, everybody who's currently on the Vermont Medicaid plan. Um, when that happens, they will find that a number of individuals and families no longer qualify for Medicaid, and therefore they will be looking for their health coverage elsewhere. Uh, so we, we did take that into account. Uh, what we did not take into account, because we don't know at the time of filing what our competitor is going to file in this market, we did not attempt to project any sort of membership uh, migration from uh, us to MVP or from MVP to us. So you didn't do any analysis then of uh, how many uh, 
how many insureds would stay with you at different rate increases? No, that was that was not part of the work that we did. Okay, and you didn't do any analysis as to how many how many new insureds would come into Blue Cross at different uh, different rate levels. Uh, we we did do the analysis of the new insureds from Medicaid, as I mentioned, uh, but that did not include an assessment of whether rate level would impact that figure. Okay, and do you do any assessment of how many people would leave Blue Cross at different uh, rate levels? Our assumption is that we would retain the same membership that we currently have in the plans in 2022. Okay. Um, could you explain, please? Well, strike that. Let, let me ask it this way. Did you, did you plan on a reduction of membership of more than 50%? between 2016 and 2021? No. Okay. In your opinion, why did Blue Cross lose so many members between 2016 and 2021? Just object to the extent that calls for speculation. Please answer the question if you can, Mr. Schultz. Uh, in my opinion, the reason for that was that MVP offered better prices on the exchange than Blue Cross did during that time period. Okay. Did you ever consider the possibility that had Blue Cross uh, uh, implemented somewhat lower uh, rate increases, it could have uh, retained more business and been more profitable than it was with a higher rate increase and less business. I agree with half of that statement. We could have retained more business, but uh, in underfunding rates intentionally to do so, that would have done the exact opposite of increasing profitability. That would have caused uh, some pretty massive losses. Okay, so it's your position that had you charged lower rates, you would have been, it, it, is it your position that had you charged lower rates, those rates would have been inadequate? Yes, I, I think that's fairly easy to see uh, based on the table to which you referred me uh, that demonstrates that the rates we actually did charge were inadequate. So it stands to reason that even lower rates would be more inadequate. Would you agree with me that at lower rates, more people would have been members of Blue Cross? Yes. And given the structure of the ACA and the various subsidies, including the three R's, would you agree with me that those additional members could have ultimately resulted in a more profitable Blue Cross individual and small group program? I consider that extremely unlikely in my professional opinion. Okay. Mr. Schultz, you were uh, discussing with Mr. Battles uh, the concept of trend, right? Yes. Okay, and there's utilization trend and there's cost trend. That's right. Okay. And is there any, uh, is there any formula that carriers must follow in calculating trends? No, there are uh, actuarial standards of practice with which we must comply, but those do not include specific formulas. Okay, so an actuarial standards practice are known as ASOPs, right? Yes. Okay, and so is, the, is there an ASOP that uh, tells the actuary how many years to consider when he's determining trend? No. Okay, is there an ASOP that tells the actuary how much weight to give different years in calculating trend? No. Okay. And is there, there, are, there are a bunch of different averages that the actuary, different types of averages that the actuary can use, right? Yes. Okay, and so is there an ASOP that tells the actuary 
which at which at which types of averages to use in calculating trend? No, the ASOPs are not that prescriptive. Okay, is are there any other standards uh, that are uh, prescriptive in connection with those issues? No, not to that level of detail. Okay, then is it fair to say that the uh, the actuary has uh, discretion in determining how many years to look at in estimating trend? Yes, the ASOPs, in fact, require the actuary to exercise their professional judgment uh, in, in performing such work. Okay. And similarly, uh, the actuary has discretion as to uh, how many, how much weight to give each year, correct? That's right. Um, and actuaries, there, there certainly could be, couldn't there, act, couldn't there be actuaries who disagree with you as to what is the, uh, based on their actuarial judgment, as to how many years to use in calculating trend? Yes, different actuaries might use a, a different approach than we did. Um, and so you would agree with me, wouldn't you, that trend, there is no one right absolute answer as to what the correct trend should be, correct? Well, there is. We just won't know what it is until after the experience actually takes place, right? I, I think we can agree on that. Okay, at yeah. the time when the actuary is determining trend at that time yeah. no one can know correct that's what, right what, yeah. what it will turn out to be i agree with you okay and so, so there's a range around the point the actuarial point estimate uh which most actuaries would consider within which most actuaries would consider the assumption to be reasonable correct yes i agree okay and is, the, is that range typically defined, for example, in, in terms of standard deviations from the actuarial point estimate? No. How, um, what, what standards are used to define that range of reasonableness? Um, really, that comes down to an assessment of the inherent variability in the estimate that you're talking about. For example, uh, when we're looking at unit cost trend, uh, there's not a whole lot of variation there uh, because those are based upon actual contracted reimbursements. Uh, utilization trend, on the other hand, has a wider amount of variation that's possible, and therefore your, your range for a reasonable unit cost trend, by way of example, would be tighter than your range for a reasonable uh, utilization trend, even though the unit cost trend itself is far larger than the utilization trend. I get it. What I'm just trying to find out, though, is is there any is there any, is there any guidance in addition to the actuary's professional actuarial judgment? Is there any guidance as to how big that range is? Uh, there's nothing that specifies that the range must be of a of a certain breadth. But the more uncertainty there is, the uh, the greater that range is, correct? Yes. Okay. And COVID, the existence of COVID has certainly added to that uncertainty, correct? It has. I mean, we, we all hope that it's going to go away, but my wife just got it. And you, you read in the paper and the New York Times every day now, deaths and cases uh, and hospitalizations are going up. None of us really know what's going to happen in the future with COVID as much as we might hope that it disappears, correct? I agree, and I'm sorry to hear about your wife. I hope she's feeling better. She'll be okay, thank you. Good, good. But it's, but it, but it's not a, it, it's tougher than you might think. All right. Thank you for your good wishes. I'd like to turn now to some questions that I have about Blue Cross's negotiations with the providers, in particular the hospitals. Mr. Schultz, are you, are you involved in any of those negotiations? I am not directly involved. Okay, but, but you're aware of them? Yes. Can you tell me, are there certain hospitals or groups of hospitals that 
Blue Cross has no discretion in negotiating with. That is, Blue Cross has no choice but to accept the rate that the hospital proposes. It, it, are, there hosp are there hospitals in that si situation? I'm sorry, I was on mute a moment ago, but I just wanted to interject that we could uh, quite easily go into confidential information in this line of questioning. So I just wanted to uh, remind uh, Mr. Angoff and uh, Mr. Schultz about that. Okay, and, and I have, I, I don't intend to talk about individual hospitals. Um, Mr. Battles, if you think we're, we're getting close to confidential uh, issues, uh, be happy to go into executive session. I'm, I'm struggling to see how I could answer that question without divulging material that's been deemed confidential in this filing. I, I was, sorry, could you restate the question? Yeah, that question I is it. very eloquently put. And at this point, I don't want to identify them, and it wouldn't mean that much to me if you did identify them. But are there, <laughs> are there hospitals that you have no choice but to accept the rate that they give to you? Okay, Mr. Schultz, you believe your an answer to that would divulge information that's been deemed confidential previously? I do, Mr. Barber. Okay, well, why don't we save that uh, question and answer for um, an executive session, potentially, should the board choose to do that uh, later on? That's fine. Uh, all right, Mr. Schultz, let me ask you this. Um, if you're, if Blue Cross, to the extent Blue Cross is losing policyholders, that's bad for administrative costs, right? That that means that administrative costs must be spread over a smaller base, and therefore, per policyholder, the administrative cost is higher, right? That's correct. Okay. Um, at the same time, though, if you're losing business, uh, might seem somewhat perverse, but that's good for your RBC ratio, right? You need less capital to support your to, to support your total business. I agree with that. Yes. Okay. And then conversely, if your if, if your business is increasing, mm -hmm. your RBC ratio needs to increase. Correct. Um, I would phrase it a little bit differently. If our if our membership is increasing, our RBC would naturally decrease, so our surplus needs to increase in order to maintain RBC. Yeah. Let me make sure I've got the increases and decreases straight. It's, if, yeah. if you, so if, if you're gaining business, mm -hmm. you're, you're, you're sur you must have a, you've got to have additional surplus to support additional business. And therefore, your RBC, all else equal, your RBC ratio goes down. Yes, if you if if surplus stays constant and you gain membership, RBC goes down. Yes, okay, I get that. And then conversely, again, regarding administrative costs, if you've got if you're gaining business, then you can spread those administrative costs over a broader base, and the administrative cost per member per month should be lower. Correct. Yes, those those things all align well. As as we gain membership, admin costs go down, which should allow us to gain more membership. Um, Blue Cross has implemented several initiatives in the past year that are designed to reduce costs, correct? Yes. Okay. Is one such initiative One Care? Um, I, I mean, that, that's not a unilateral Blue Cross initiative, but uh, yes, our, our partnership with One Care is one way in which we we hope to uh, bend the cost curve in the future. Yeah. Um, let me make clear. I'm, uh, I don't know whether I'm going to go through four or five different uh, arguably cost cutting initiatives. I don't know whether the, the initiative or the initiative comes from Blue Cross or state. 
or not, or who it touched on. I'm just trying to find out whether Blue yeah. Cross has found that it, it works. Okay, so One Care, what is One Care? Uh, One Care is an ACO or Accountable Care Organization. Um, it's uh, it's organized. Um, it's an independent organization that's that's recently uh, been turned into a nonprofit, and its goal is to uh, uh, affect the the triple aim of increasing quality, reducing cost, and having better outcomes. Okay, and in Blue Cross's current rate filing, has Blue Cross reduced the proposed rate at all to reflect the uh, the benefits of One Care? Um, not directly. Our partnership with OneCare has been in place for a number of years, and so uh, the results of that work are in experience already. They're already in the trends that we're analyzing, and so we're assuming that any benefit from that work uh, will continue into the future through the trend assumption uh, that we use in the, in the development of the rates. In the development of rates, you do uh, include a a, a cost for one care, correct? Yes. Okay. Have you done any analysis to determine whether the benefit outweighs the cost? Uh, yes, we have. And what did that analysis show? Uh, it, it's inconclusive, particularly in the most recent years because of the impacts of COVID. It's really difficult to, to tell uh, whether one care has achieved its goals or not. Um, what is Civica RX? Civica RX is a uh, new nonprofit company. Uh, the Blue Cross is is um, uh, contributed an equity contribution toward, um, and the goal of Civica RX is to manufacture generic drugs and sell them at cost. Uh, and specifically, they're looking to manufacture generic drugs that are uh, generally single source drugs, which means there's there's usually only one manufacturer today. And those drugs appear to be sold today at an enormous profit to that single manufacturer. So Civica RX is kind of stepping into that space in a way that's going to allow us to actually change the cost of healthcare by delivering generic drugs at cost rather than at an enormous profit. Um, in this in, in this year's rate filing, though, you haven't uh, included any savings. This year's rate filing does not uh, reflect any uh, savings uh, from Civica RX, correct? It, it does reflect a very small amount of savings. Civica is just beginning operations um, and starting the manufacturer or expects to start by 2023, the manufacturer of its first four generic drugs. Um, none of those drugs are particularly um, enormously utilized, um, but you know, it's a, it's a start, it's a place to start. So we are reflecting that uh, small amount of savings in these rates. Is there a line item somewhere for the extent to which Civica RX reduces rates? Um, I believe there is, but I think it's uh, uh, coupled with the um, improvement that we have through Vermont Blue RX, uh, which is our uh, um, the the broader pharmacy programming that we're delivering to the market. So I, I testified earlier that the combination of those two things saved about 1.3 percent of premium uh, in this year's rate filings. Okay, I, I don't want to take up too much time with this, but can you? Can you try to find the reference to Civica RX in the rate filing? Because I wasn't able to find it. Um, I'm sure I could, but I, I don't know that I can uh, at the tip of my fingers. Okay, maybe I'll be maybe I will be able to find it. In the meantime, let me ask you about the Vermont Flu Integrated Care program, uh, which you reference on page 24 of the rate filing. Um, what is that? Yeah, Vermont Blue Integrated Care is a new program that we're putting in place uh, with a select number of uh, PCP offices. Um, 
And the goals of that program are similar to the goals I described for one care is to improve outcomes um, and lower costs uh, uh, at the same time uh, as improving quality and improving outcomes. Okay. Um, so it's sorry. it's not entirely dissimilar from the One Care Initiative, except that this is a Blue Cross initiative. It's a Blue Cross led initiative. And is there any line item reflecting savings produced by the VBIC program in the rate filing? Um, no. Okay. Um, but there is a cost to that program, right? And that cost is eight dollars PMPM. For attributed members, so the, the as you can see in the table at the bottom of twenty page twenty four, the projected combined PMPM is fourteen cents. Sorry, how do you get from eight bucks to fourteen cents? Uh, it's based on the number of lives that are attributed within this model. So there's there's limited number of providers do not see every life in our ACA filings. They're they're not. Um, Right, so they based on the the number of providers with whom we contract, uh, they see only a limited number of patients. You can see the attributed members, in fact, in the box at the bottom of page uh, 24. Uh, we're talking about 574 individual members, 684 small group members, out of a population of about 20,000 um, in each docket. Okay, then it, it's fair to say, isn't it, then that the cost to your members of uh, of uh, VBIC is trivial. It, it is 14 cents is quite small, yes. Uh, what is the CAA? Uh, you refer to that in your uh, in your rate filing as one of the one of the potential uh, cost reducing cost reducing measures. Yeah, that's um, the Consolidated Appropriations Act of 2021. That's, so that's recently uh, passed federal legislation that calls for a whole lot of provisions. Everything from it impacts everything from ID cards uh, to the way uh, certain out-of-network providers are reimbursed, and, and a number of other things as well. Okay. And you don't, uh, if I understand what you said in the rate filing. You don't anticipate uh, saving. You're, you're not including any savings from that in the rate filing. Uh, we, based on the information we have, we don't think there will be savings from the from the CAA. It's it's unclear at this time. Uh, the the only you know there's clearly going to be additional administrative cost, and insofar as that cost has already shown up in our base period, it is reflected in the rates. Um, what's unclear is whether some of that regulation will result in savings um, for some of those out of network providers. Um, it, at this point, some commentators believe that it's going to increase cost for those providers. Others believe it will decrease cost. Um, but because it's unclear at this time, we did not include anything uh, additional or any, any decreases to the rates. So based on what you know so far, obviously things can change in the future, but this is this is something that that uh, increases costs at least marginally for Blue Cross, and so far anyway has not uh, produced any benefit. Correct. Uh, could you turn to page twelve of your rate filing? Yes. Okay. In the. Uh, the, the second under paragraph 3.1 there, the second paragraph, the second line, which starts with we completed. You see that? Yes, I see it. Okay. And then you talk there about uh, financial statement reserves, best estimates before margin. Do you see that? Yes, I do. What is margin in that context? Uh, so statutory accounting principles require that we include implicit uh, or and or explicit margin uh, in our projection of any obligations and our, of any actuarial obligations. Uh, so that's specifically done for statutory accounting um, because statutory accounting is, is meant to protect uh, consumers against potential insolvencies. So there, there's a requirement in statutory accounting um, that we uh, uh, assess um, any sort of liabilities and assets 
using assumptions that uh, reflect uh, marginally adverse events. Um, there's also a requirement that we that we include this margin. I, I just want to make it perfectly clear that is for statutory accounting purposes. When we're talking about these rates, you can see the note that says best estimates before margin. We do not include uh, explicit or implicit margin in these rates, except in as much as contribution to policyholder reserves is sometimes referred to as margin. I think I understood what you said, except that I don't, I did not understand what margin is in connection with reserves. What is it? Right. So it, with respect to reserves for statutory accounting purposes, and this is, um, this is different from the concept of policyholder reserves. Here I am referring to um, actual liabilities such as incurred but not reported claims. When we estimate incurred but not reported claims at a certain point in time, uh, we apply an explicit margin um, of 10 or 15 percent, depending on the, the, the time of year, quite frankly. Um, if we have a month of additional run out, it's only 10 percent. And that is in accordance with statutory accounting guidelines. So that's that's the margin that I'm referring to. It's margin for a statutory accounting uh, calculation. Yeah, so so is, it, is it fair to say that margin is a safety uh, a safety uh, amount? Uh, yes, yes. Uh, could you turn please to exhibit ten and uh, look at page two of Exhibit 10. Okay. Okay, you see uh, number three there, there's a discussion of what's going to happen with the Medicaid enrollees. Yes. Okay. And your answer to that, that question confirms that you're assuming that 100% of Medicaid enrollees who lose eligibility but are eligible for premium subsidies will purchase coverage, correct? That's a Just little bit of an oversimplification. The answer oh. speaks for itself there. I think there was a misstatement of the percentage there. Okay, uh, Mr. Schultz, could you read the question and then your answer to number three? Sure, section 3.4.1 of the memorandum appears to assume that 100% of Medicaid and release who lose eligibility but are eligible for premium subsidies will purchase coverage. Please confirm and justify. And we confirmed that that was, that was indeed our assumption. Okay. And my only question regarding that question and answer is, is it realistic to assume that 100% is the 100% is the realistic? Um, I, I think it is. Uh, most of these individuals are going to be heavily subsidized, but it's important to think about that assumption in context. Uh, we are using some pretty broad assumptions based on some national studies of both the Vermont market and, and the nationwide market in terms of both how many members are likely to be uh, disenrolled from the Medicaid books and what proportion of those members are going to uh, get coverage through employer plans versus the individual market. Um, so admittedly, there's some fairly broad assumptions there, um, but I, I point out two things. One is that as you and I have talked about, Mr. Angoff, the assumption of higher membership leads to an assumption of lower admin costs. So um, while 100% may or may not be possible, 102% or 150% is pretty unlikely. Um, so in my mind, we've made the assumption that, that goes toward minimizing premiums as a result of this additional membership. Um, I'll also point out that Lewis and Ellis examined this assumption and they reached similar conclusions that you did. They think we're being a little bit aggressive in terms of what we're assuming here. And aggressive in this context means um, creating rates that may be a little bit lower than what may actually happen if say 92% or 97% of that membership enrolls in our plans. And as you and I have also discussed, Mr. Schultz, lower administrative costs, on the one hand, lower administrative costs result from greater membership, lower, lower administrative costs per member per month results from greater membership, mm -hmm. but also greater membership 
means you need more surplus and therefore your RBC ratio goes down, right? Yes. Okay. Um, could you turn to on the same exhibit uh, page four? Okay. Okay, and you see those uh, 2018 through 2023 uh, projected, what are those, utilization trend numbers? Yes, that's uh, facility costs per member per month normalized for cost increases and a, a couple of other items. Okay, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time <clears throat> arguing with you about this. I'd just like you to respond to, if you don't mind, my uh, my impression of what those numbers show, and you tell me how I'm wrong if, if I am wrong. Sure. Okay. Okay, so I, so I see that from 2018, 2019, which is pre-COVID, the number goes down. Yes. 2020, it goes way down, presumably because of COVID. Right. I'd throw that out because of COVID. 2021 is back to normal, at least to a certain extent, to, to a large extent, and that's that's a little a little uh, above what it was in 2019, but still below 2018. Mm -hmm. My question is, based on those numbers, wouldn't it be reasonable to assume at least a modest decline from the 297 for 2021 rather than a uh, rather than the increases you have that you've shown there. No, and I say that for two reasons. Uh, first, actual 2018 results were a high outlier, meaning there was a sizable increase from 2017 to 2018. Uh, it was it was not surprising that 2019 came in lower than 2018 um, because 2018 itself was a high outlier. Um, if I were to uh, add some additional useful information to this table, uh, you might reach a different conclusion because you would see that from 2017 to 2019, there was positive trend. So that minus 2.9% uh, was not indicative of overall underlying trend and certainly not indicative of future trend. Uh, the other reason I would disagree is that we know that Vermont hospitals are engaging in revenue enhancement efforts. Um, and what that means is they're trying to get, they're, they're trying to generate more income, uh, more ways of getting paid, higher claims. Uh, more revenue for hospitals means higher claims for Blue Cross. So while I, you know, I, I could agree that looking at the data and including 2017, you might conclude that the underlying trend rate uh, may be around 1%, um, which is what Lewis and Ellis concluded. I would caution you that it's important to consider how future trend might be different from recent past experience. And based on what we're seeing and hearing from local Vermont hospitals, we have every reason to believe that future trend will be higher than recently past trend experience. Um, and that's what we reflected in our own assumption. We, we modestly increased that assumption in the expectation that hospitals would be successful in their revenue enhancement activities. And by revenue enhancement, you mean what? Revenue enhancement for a hospital means they get paid more money, right? So they're, they're providing uh, uh, services to either the population for which they'll get paid more money, um, or they're providing services that are simply more profitable to them. Um, but revenue enhancement for a hospital means higher claims for a payer. Okay, you, and so where, if at all, does whatever action the board takes with respect to the proposed hospital rate increases in August fit in? So this is a farm, but you can answer it. Sorry, man. I just said, it was just an injection to the form, but you can, you can answer it. Thanks. Um, so the decisions the board makes in the hospital budget submissions impact the medical unit cost trend. This particular information we were just talking about has to do with the medical utilization trend. Um, they're not entirely divorced from each other, um, but they are two separate assumptions. Um, 
so we, we would we would consider the hospital budget decisions in unit cost trend and not in utilization trend. Okay, I get it. Um, can you give me specific examples of what you call revenue enhancement activities that hospitals uh, engage in? I I can. Um, we actually included as part of my supplemental pre-file testimony, we included the University of Vermont Health Network uh, hospital budget narrative. Um, and I did not flag a useful page for that, which is quite unfortunate. But they they speak in the narrative. Um, one of the one of the questions or concerns they address are is basically what is the hospital doing? To try to enhance revenue, because their you know, their whole idea is that they're losing money, they need to replenish their own funds, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and so they they list a number of initiatives that they are undertaking uh, as an attempt to increase revenue. Um, these include things like uh, reducing uh, uh, reducing wait times for services, so that they can perform more. Um, reconstructive surgeries, by way of example, so that that's the type of thing that um, can increase future trend above past uh, past performance. Okay, and has Blue Cross done any analysis as to the extent, if any, to which these uh, revenue enhancement uh, techniques techniques uh, improve the quality of care? No. Um, Okay, just one more question about these these uh, six numbers here on page four. Would it be unreasonable, Mr. Schultz, to to reason as follows? Okay, 2018, 303. That was that that was uh, unusually high, or, or I forget what you said. That was unusually high, or 2019 was unusually low. W which was it? 18 was unusually high. Okay, so we throw out 2018 because it was unusually high. Draw out 2020 because it was COVID. So what you're left with is 295 and 297, two buck difference. Why would, wouldn't it be reasonable then to project 2022 at 299 and 2023 at 301? Um, again, in my professional opinion, that would not be reasonable. Uh, we did a more detailed analysis than that, than, than looking at two numbers on a table. And we determined that the you know the underlying and L and E did a similar analysis. Both parties determined that an underlying trend is likely in the neighborhood of one percent. Uh, we believe it would be not be reasonable. Excuse me. We believe it would not be reasonable to project that underlying trend forward, uh, which is what we've what I've testified in my uh, supplemental pre-filed testimony. In part because we are aware that hospitals in Vermont are engaged in activities that are designed to increase utilization. Uh, in 2023. Is there anything that Blue Cross can do to counter activities uh, designed to increase utilization? Yes, but I, I don't know that we would want to counter these health network activities. The goal of these activities is to reduce wait times um, and to make better use of the hospital beds that they have available so that patients with more acute needs can use those beds. Those are those are laudable things. We should be encouraging that activity. Well, the, but, sorry, go ahead. The the this is a trade-off between access to care and affordability. In this instance, the health network is engaging in activities that are going to increase access to care. Reduce their goal is to reduce wait wait times, and their goal is to increase access to hospital beds and surgery rooms for for members with acute issues. Um, both of those increase access, but they also decrease affordability. Costs are higher because of those activities. But it, it's a trade-off that if, um, if you know, we're not as a state, it you know, becomes a policy decision. If as a state we decide we don't want to reduce wait times and we don't want to make sure those hospital beds are available, then uh, we can, as a policy decision, decide that we don't want hospitals to engage in those sorts of activities. That will certainly bring premium rates down, but it certainly won't do anything to curb the problems that we've been facing with wait times during the pandemic. 
you did testify just now, though, didn't you, that you have not done any analysis as to whether the hospital uh, revenue enhancement activities uh, increase the quality of care? Correct. Okay, I just got a few more questions. I, I appreciate your being patient, and I appreciate the board's being patient. Uh, could you turn to page 31? I think we've discussed this in past years, uh, and that is the mental health trend of 8.5 percent, which, which you say is going to uh, continue even when COVID uh, goes away or COVID, uh, COVID improves. The COVID situation improves. I just like to know what is the basis for that 8.5 percent. What did you rely on for that 8.5 percent? Yeah, so we relied on a couple of things. We looked at the uh, utilization of those services even before COVID, and that utilization was trending at, at quite a high rate, um, around 10% to my recollection. Um, we can see that utilization of these services continues to trend at a high rate uh, during COVID. And uh, again, speaking to future trends, we can observe that Blue Cross is engaging with the healthcare uh, provider community to make access to mental health services more uh, uh, more available uh, to Vermonters. It's, it's well understood that we are facing a mental health crisis uh, as we are hopefully coming out of the pandemic, but kind of still mired within it. And we couple that with the current financial crisis that's, that's not doing uh, great things for people's mental health. Um, it's what, you know, so it's well known that that is taking place and there are efforts underway to ensure that the that the uh, supply of mental health services is there to meet the demand, uh, for that reason, uh, we believe that that it's uh, natural to conclude that mental health services will continue to trend at a, at a um, relatively high level. Um, and Lewis and Ellis reviewed that assumption and they agreed with it. I don't I don't see any numbers in here. Maybe there were in exhibits and I missed them. But I don't see any numbers in here that justify that 8.5%. Can you point me to any, any such numbers? Um, I'm, I don't know that we included that uh, within the filing. It may be, it's, it's almost certainly in one of the exhibit numbers, one of the exhibits in uh, section two, but I, I can't off the top of my head point you to which one of those it would be. Could you turn, to, please, to page 32 of the rate filing? Yes. One minute. Okay. Okay, in the bottom paragraph, you're, you're, you're assuming there a 14%. Well, wait, before I ask you that, is it, is it your position, Mr. Schultz, that any uh, mental health trend of below 8.5% is unreasonable? Um, not necessarily. I have not assessed uh, an assumption that is different from eight and a half to determine whether it's reasonable or not. Um, but I'm not prepared to say that anything below eight and a half would be unreasonable. Um, okay, let's go back to page 32, the bottom paragraph there. You're talking about a 14% uh, trend for, uh, for biosimilars. Is that right? Um, it's a 14% trend combined for the the um, the specialty drug, the injections, and the biosimilar. So it's those those two things together. You can think of the injection itself as, as a brand drug and a biosimilar more or less as a generic. So the 14% is for the combination of those two uh, different types of drugs that treat the same uh, illness. So it's it's for a combination of the injections with biosimilar equivalent and biosimilars? Yes. Okay. So I don't see how you, can you explain to me why that 14% is your assumption when the five different, uh, five different averages are you, that were, were at, can you explain to me why that 14% is what you selected when you've got five numbers there um, only one, only the highest one of which is 14, and you've got something that's as low as 4.4. You're not taking an average there, you're taking the highest number, correct? Well, I, I can see that the two of these numbers are in very close agreement, the 36-month regression and the 24-month regression. Uh, I put more stock in the regressions, which are statistical 
approaches to um, observing past data than I do in the year over year. The year over year can be infect, affected by a whole lot of things, um, the pandemic being a notable example. The statistical regressions though are, are quite consistent, um, falling right near 14%. So we, we put our stock in the statistical regressions um, rather than that year over year result that looks like a clear outlier. Um. You're not saying, though, are you, that any assumption that is less than 14% is unreasonable? I am not. Could you turn, to, please, to page 35? Yes. Okay, and there you've got a, a bunch of different, uh, what should I call those? Are those averages, the, the, uh, the 10 or so entries that you have there? What, what, how should I describe them? Um, most of those are results of statistical analysis of past data. Okay, uh, so, 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 so you've got, got 10 or a dozen different statistical analyses of past data. How did you come to, uh, to select those 10 to look at? Um, those, those are 10 pretty, pretty common um, measures. We thought it was important to look at quarterly drug trend because a lot of scripts are filled as 90-day supplies. Most maintenance scripts are. So you can sometimes see some sort of odd fluctuations from month to month that could impact the statistical analysis. And by using quarterly regressions um, and quarterly time series analysis, we're able to smooth out those fluctuations and kind of get that noise out of there. Um, so the this is a pretty comprehensive list on, of the type of analyses that we will do um, on historical data. And you can see the vast majority of these numbers are, are pretty pretty close to 2%. Um, there's a couple high outliers that are closer to three. There's a couple low outliers closer to one, but most of them are converging right around two. So we can feel pretty comf confident that uh, underlying trend uh, for this particular item, which is non-specialty drug utilization is Right, right in the ballpark of 2%. Okay, so you're comfortable that 2% is reasonable? 2%, yes, is reasonable in my actuarial opinion. I'm sorry if you can hear my three-year-old in the background. Well, not quite three, almost three-year-old in the background. Right? That's good three-year-old. Good for uh, you. She's a natural entertainer, so I hope, good for uh, you, Paul. hope you're entertaining. Good for you. I love you. Okay, you're not saying that anything less than 2% would necessarily be unreasonable. Um, I, I think it would be unreasonable to diverge significantly from 2%. Uh, for example, looking at, at those results, I don't think a 1.5% trend would be reasonable. What about 1.7? I, I haven't done a full assessment of 1.7. I'm not sure whether that would be reasonable or not. Very good. Please turn to page 39. I'm there. Okay, so you see the, uh, the right-hand column lists under combined factor, cost trend factor 1.14? Um, yes, yes I do. Okay, that's, how do you, obviously that's a bigger number than the numbers we've been talking about. How do you arrive at that number? Yeah, that's, that's intended to refer to unit cost trend. Um, so when we look at utilization trend, all the numbers we've just been talking about inform different components of utilization trend. Um, and that factor, by the way, is a, that's a two-year factor. So we, that's the factor we apply to go from 2021 to 2023. That includes two years of trend. Oh, okay. So that, that, that explains it. The, the fact that, 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 that includes two years of trend. It's not, it's not one year. Correct. That's two years of trend, right? Okay. Um, please go to page 53, and I'll ask you a couple of questions about administrative costs, and that will be it before I ask you questions about an executive session, which will include the hospital-related questions that Mr. Battles was concerned appropriately with, and also I will ask you some RBC-related questions. But just to end the public portion, uh, 
On page 53, you're talking about Blue Cross base administ administrative charges. Is there a difference between well, let me ask it this way: What 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 is the base? What are Blue Cross's base administrative charges? Those are the charges that we incur as part of our own operating budget. They can be distinguished from um, certain. Well, they can be distinguished from a couple of other things. One, they can be distinguished from uh, new services that we intend to provide. Those become ultimately part of our base admin. Um, but are, we're not part of our base admin in 2021. They can also be distinguished from charges for certain outside vendors, including dental and vision uh, vendors and HRA and HSA integration services. Those charges are listed separately on page 56. Okay. Are base administrative charges, the base administrative charges for the entire Blue Cross entity? Um, no, we're we're looking at base administrative charges specific to the ACA business. Okay. Uh, in the uh, bottom paragraph, the fifth line from the bottom view, there's a sentence that says Blue Cross had higher pension benefit expenses in 2021 due to the loss incurred in 2020. Do you see that? Yes, I do. Okay. Could you explain what that means? Um, yeah, our, our pension fund uh, had losses. Uh, the investment fund had significant losses in 2020. And uh, there's there's a lot of actuarial mathematics. It's not, not work that I do, but work that pension actuaries do to determine how your pension funded status uh, results in, a, in an expense that you have to book annually uh, to reflect that. So what, what this paragraph says is that we, we did have higher pension expenses in 2021 because of those asset losses in 2020, but that we made sure to exclude um, any amounts in excess of the uh, current expectation for long-term pension expenses. So in other words, that, that, that was one of the one-time charges that I testified to earlier that we remove from our base admin before we project forward. We're, we're not passing that increase through in these rates. Okay, but conceptually, and there's no need to go into the any big argument about the pension loss, but conceptually, the pension loss increases admin? Factually speaking, the pension loss increased admin in 2021, but it did not increase the admin component of within these rate filings. Um, could you turn, please, to the next page, page 54, uh, in the middle paragraph, right under the little uh, the little chart there? You project basic. You're using a four percent annual trend for base administrative charges. Do you see that? I do. But within that paragraph, there's you refer to a three percent uh, personnel cost increase. Why would the uh, annual trend be four percent, notwithstanding the personal cost increase of three percent? The three percent refers to our uh, assumption used in prior filings. Uh, we've replaced that assumption in light of inflationary pressures to use a four percent uh, annual inflation on administrative charges. But should not raise the cost of any uh, of everything. Shouldn't the relationship between admin and total uh, the total costs be the same regardless of inflation? I, um, I, would you mind clarifying the question? I'm, I'm not sure, sure I'm following. I, sure. Yeah. You and I agree, don't we, that, that inflation raises costs? Yes, we agree. Okay. And so... Uh, Unless there's a, so I would think that whatever denominator you're using for that 3% or 4%, inflation also, also affects that. So that I wouldn't think the ratio, that is the admin percentage, would change because of inflation. If I'm wrong, tell me. And, but Admin is a percentage of premium. Um, 
in, in fact, ad minimum as a percentage of premium goes down in, in these filings over time, we're assuming a 4% inflationary impact on admin charges. And as we just discussed at length, uh, the trend that we are using on medical services uh, is much higher than 4%, driven by uh, the increased prices that are being demanded by hospitals and other providers. Um, so yeah, in, in fact, over time, the admin as a percent of total premium uh, decreases in this filing from, from 2021 through 2023. You're saying admin as a percentage of premium decreases even though you're using even though you're using a 4% trend to increase admin? Yes, the 4% trend is applied to a per member per month charge. Um, and that, that per member per month charge uh, is, is but a relatively small portion of the total premium. So if we have 90% of the premium, uh, which reflects the cost of health care, it's increasing at a medical trend that's much higher than 4%. And we have about 7% of the premium that's increasing at an inflationary uh, rate of 4%. Uh, the percentage of that smaller amount for the admin will decrease over time relative to the, to the premium itself. Okay, I think I understand. I'm not gonna waste your time trying to nail it down so that I'm sure that I understand. Just let me, and this may be my final question. Um, on page 54, this paragraph second from the bottom that begins, we are experiencing, you see that? Yes. And you talk about new capability, you're introducing new capabilities uh, outside of Blue Cross's core operating platform. Can you tell me there what you're talking, can you tell me what that paragraph's about? Sure, by way of example, um, we have introduced a Medicare Advantage product to the marketplace. That product, while it increases Blue Cross's membership, those, those members are Blue Cross members, um, that, that product is not serviced on Blue Cross's operating system. So while it will look like, and in fact, our, our overall membership is increasing, the, the portion of that membership that is serviced on the Blue Cross operating model and operating system is decreasing. So that's that's what that paragraph's attempting to get at. It's we we so in other words, we cannot spread our administrative costs over those Medicare Advantage lives because those admin, our administrative costs have nothing to do with those Medicare Advantage lives. Okay, so if, so individual and small group members admin does not include any cost for Medicare Advantage. That's right. Yeah. Um. Mr. H uh, hearing officer, I have no more questions. Mr. Schultz, thank you for your patience. And Mr. Chair and board members, thank you very much for your patience. Okay, so next to, um, well, the board, but uh, before we do that, Ms. Belvo, do you have any questions for Mr. Schultz? I do not, thank you. So we'll go through the board members, starting with board member Lunge. Thank you. Um, hi, Mr. Schultz. I hope you're doing well today, and it's a pleasure to hear your your child in the background. Always fun. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> you're welcome. Um, so I did have a couple of questions I wanted to ask you um, about. First of all, related to the assumptions um, about the emergency department utilization um, and those other services, I don't have the list at the top of my head, ED, urgent care, et cetera. Right. Um, so the, the underlying assumption there uh, that I believe you're making is that uh, COVID waves will not result in the suppression of that care in 2023. Is that correct? That is correct. Okay. Um, and so then moving to a different topic, sorry, I'm gonna be jumping around based on my notes. Quite all right. Um, so also in the filing, you discuss uh, some assumptions related to facilities, um, utilization being suppressed due to workforce issues. 
uh, you have to verbalize your response, I'm afraid. Yes, yes that's right. <laughs> For the record. Um, and what is the basis for that assumption? The specific assumption that there's been some suppression due to workforce issues? Yes. Um, that's based on information that we've uh, learned in conversations with hospitals uh, over the course of the past year. And um, that is uh, kind of reviewed in spades in the UVMHN health in the budget narrative by way of example. Okay. And uh, do you expect that those workforce capacity issues to be corrected in 2023? Um, we, we hope so. Um, that's, that's part of the basis for the, um, dare I say, gargantuan increases that have been requested by UVMHN and some other hospitals. Their, their intention is to address those issues. Um, and I, I think for public health reasons, we all hope they are in fact able to address those issues. Okay, thank you. Um, in terms of um, COVID, we are currently still in the federal public health emergency. Is that correct? I agree. Do you happen to know when that is set to expire? <laughs> um, I, I wish I did. Um, the original thinking was that it was going to be allowed to expire um, right about now. Um, I think the, the order that was uh, extended in early April was set to expire, I, I believe, on July 15th. I, I actually haven't checked to see whether that's been officially extended. The thought was that it was going to be extended um, because the government did not notify states that they were going to let it expire. Um, the, they had said they were going to notify states because states needed to kind of get the machine cranking on uh, eligibility recertification for Medicaid once that health emergency expires. So they, they didn't make that notification. So the thought was it would be extended for another three months. It can only be extended 90 days at a time. Um, what I'm hearing is that it's likely to be extended through the end of this calendar year, but, um, but it's, it's kind of anybody's guess in a way. Okay, thank you. But, but it's fair to say the feds have not given that 60 days notice that you just referred to, at least not to your knowledge. To the best of my knowledge, they have not done so. I just want to make sure that Mr. Angoff is still with us. He's frozen on my screen. Are you are you able to listen to this, Mr. Angoff? Am I unfrozen now? Yes, thanks. Thank you. Okay, sorry, Robin. No, thank you, Mike. I, I'm focused on my notes, so I'm not really looking at my screen. So please feel free to jump in as needed. Okay, so, and I think um, when you were testifying around about Exhibit 30 today, I believe you indicated, and I just wanna make sure I heard this correctly, that in, and actually let me move to Exhibit 30. So I have it in front of me. Okay. So in, on Exhibit 30, you have the expected increase from hospital budgets, and I believe you testified that in calculating that impact, uh, you used, understandably, uh, your own medical utilization trend, not LNE's recommendation. Is that correct? For medical utilization trend, yes, that's correct. Okay, thank you. So, and you and uh, Mr. Enghoff spoke to this a little bit earlier, but I just wanted to clarify. So when you're talking about uh, revenue enhancement activities, it sounded like the basis of knowledge for that is the UVM narrative. Is that correct? Um, that supplemented our knowledge of that. Our, our knowledge of that originally came from conversations that we've been having with hospitals, um, kind of through our provider relations department. Uh, over the course of the last many months. So we, we were aware that that was the intention of hospitals uh, at the time of filing. The budget narrative simply confirmed uh, what we understood to be true about their activities in that space. And is that all hospitals? Uh, quite honestly, I, I haven't reviewed all of the budget narratives. Um, I, I would expect that it is most of them. Um, but as, as we both know, UVM uh, Health Network is the strong majority of the, of the care that, we, that is provided to facilities in Vermont. 
Thank you. Um, and also in your back and forth with Mr. Enghoff, um, you indicated that the hospital budget decisions impact medical unit cost trend. Um, and I understand that you didn't consider the hospital budget narratives for your utilization trend, but you are aware that the board approves a cap on net patient revenue, are you not? I am. And net patient revenue for hospitals includes both unit cost and utilization? That's my understanding. Okay, thank you. Let me just, I think I'm almost done. Let me just check some other notes. I do have, um, Mike, this is just for your, Mike Barber, just for your knowledge. I do have a couple of questions related to confidential materials that I'll hold. Um, so I will be asking um, at some point that we go into executive session, but I'll hold that until everyone else has a chance to ask their questions. Okay. Um, Related in general to utilization, um, I am interested in understanding larger utilization trends in your book of business and variation by hospital. Um, and I understand that this may not be something that you're prepared to answer today, but what I'm wondering is if it would be possible for the board to get utilization information by hospital broken out by the three main service categories, inpatient, outpatient, and professional services, for calendar year 2021. I think this would help us have an understanding of broader utilization trends across uh, your book of business in general. Um, and it would also be helpful to see your estimates specific to the emergency department, similar to what you provided lumped together with the urgent care and other suppression. Mm -hmm. um, that's particularly helpful, quite frankly, in comparing the utilization assumptions in the hospital budgets that we receive later, but it would be wow. helpful if that's information or analysis that you might be able to provide. I believe that's something we should be able to assemble after the hearing, of course, but yeah, we, course. we should be able to pull that together. Great. Okay. It's confidential. Um, oh, that one is confidential. <laughs> Okay, um, I believe that's it. I have a couple other tabs to go through, but Mike, just in the interest of time, uh, perhaps we should go to other folks and I'll just take a double check through my notes and uh, let you know if I have anything else, if you don't mind coming back to me if necessary. Great, so next we'll move to board member Pelham. Do you have questions for Mr. Schultz? I uh, I do. I, I your your voice came across a little. You pointed you pointed in my direction, right, Mike? I did. Yes. Thanks. Um, so I kind of want to pick up where I left off last year in the rate review um, and uh, the concurring opinion um, that I had last year on both uh, Blue Cross Blue Shield and MVP that basically lamented that because of the uh, pandemic, we couldn't uh, spend a lot of fixed prospective payments and with um, the cost shift. So I just want to focus a little bit, uh, pick up that thread a little bit um, here. And I'd like to refer um, to a an email that uh, Don George um, sent out on um, <clears throat> March 28th, uh, 2022 to um uh the community basically it was a went out to all community leaders and the topic of it was why we oppose mid-year increases um if i may uh, quote from that um he said in this letter uh email we must turn determinedly toward value-based payments and global hospital budgets to think more holistically about patient health rather than incentivizing volume by paying for each service individually. And I assume by that he means fee for service. Um, so I'm looking at that language and then I'm looking at um, 
uh, Exhibit 1, where um, <clears throat> um, the uh, presentation, the board filing says, because the performance to date of this arrangement, and that has to do with uh, with basically one care and the health care reform efforts, um, because the performance to date of this arrangement gives no clear basis for projecting savings in the near term, this filing does not include any adjustment to projected expenditures related to the one care program. And so last year, the uh, looking at the development of the index rate, there was a minuscule amount of of, of uh, converting um, uh, capitated uh, payments to fee for service, and um, and similarly in the index rate this year, um, it is nineteen dollars of the seven hundred and seventy nine dollars, uh, and. Um, and which is to me a diminutive amount. And um, and I, I worry or I wonder um, what will happen if the commercial carriers don't get off the sidelines in terms of of capitated payments um, or and and kind of, or stay on the sidelines. It's um, kind of looking at uh, uh, um, just a couple more seconds here. Looking at Medicare. Um, the one care is projecting a 53.4% um, participation. Uh, looking at Medicaid, 58.2%. Um, Medicaid in the uh, administration's implementation improvement plan said very good things about how um, uh, capitated payments have been beneficial to Medicaid. Uh, the NORC study uh, said similar uh, things about uh, the Medicaid uh, engagement, and but I worry that that these are large fish, but they're not the largest fish. The largest fish in the payment pond is are the ca are the uh, carriers, and uh, so here again, you know, we're down to a minuscule amount. I mean, it's in in tenths of a percent in terms of of um, ca of uh, capitated payments as part of the index rate, and I just wonder um, what. Well, the outcome will be of the if, if Blue Cross Blue Shield has any sense of of the weight of their participation in healthcare reform, and if you know here we are in the fifth year of the all payer model, um, and, and and without significant engagement in uh, capitation, the um, one one care has established a target for commercial uh, for 2023 at 23.9 percent. Of, uh, of um, I think I think the, the the reference that they made was uh, where do we go if 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 next year we're in the same place as we are this year, which is the same place that we were in last year, you know, does that could mean that uh, a, a, a pillar of of um, of healthcare reform in Vermont um, is just uh, it, it is not there, and um, I fear that all this effort that everyone's putting into healthcare reform may collapse. And I'm just wondering if, kind of more broadly, not in you know, you have a, a a sense of of where Blue Cross Blue Shield might go. You know, um, um, well, we know where you want to go for 2023, but 2024. And finally, the second part of that question. Would the would we have a copy of the analysis supporting um, the language uh, of, of of CEO George that the performance to date of this arrangement gives no clear basis for projecting savings? So I think would think there's some kind of technical analysis behind that statement, and I'm wondering if we could see it. Um, I I can certainly pursue that. Um, so the. Sorry, Mr. Pelham. I think the, the question is where Blue Cross stands relative to fixed prospective payment. Is that an adequate summary of what you've asked? Well, well, it's the contrast. It's the contrast of what CEO President Don George says and what the uh, what we find in this filing. It's a, uh, you know, so he he has an aspirational and positive view of, um, according to his email, of. Um, uh, value-based payments, um, but in the filing, there's minimal value-based payments, and I'm just wondering, is there a strategy on the part of Blue Cross Blue Shield to close that gap 
in favor of value-based payments? Absolutely. Or, or, or do I worry, one more thing, I just got to get this out. Mm -hmm. Do I worry that what we have is a, is a Blue Cross Blue Shields likes fee for service. It's what you do. You probably do it very well. And it's, mm -hmm. it's the culture of the company. And are, 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 are we just stuck with fee for service? I don't think we're stuck with fee for service, but I, I can also say that Blue Cross cannot unilaterally implement uh, value-based arrangements. We we need the hospitals and other providers to be willing to enter into that as well. Um, we answered a recent question. I was just looking for it unsuccessfully um, that discussed our uh, ongoing uh, pursuit of fixed perspective payment and value-based arrangements, and in particular through One Care. Um, and where we've landed with One Care for 2023 is that we're we're doing a lot of work um, to agree on uh, a, a fair, equitable um, uh, uh, target setting process that is can, can be shown to deliver value to consumers. And that's that's fairly easy to say, but it's a lot harder to do, um, especially coming off the back of the pandemic where we we more or less remove risk from the arrangements because we we had little idea of what in the world was going to happen uh, with this pandemic uh, having its impact. Um, so our focus for 2023, uh, at least with One Care, is to get that target setting process and re, you know, reestablish the risk sharing arrangement that we had before the pandemic um, so that we do have some risk sharing over and above just straight fee for service. Once we have that pulled together and in place, the intention is then to build upon that to establish fixed prospective payment um, at you know, whichever facilities are, are willing to participate in that sort of arrangement. Um, so it's, yeah, I, I don't think we're on the sidelines at all. I think we are right in the middle of the field and in fact calling plays. Um, but, you know, we're, we're not the only ones out there. We, we have one care out there with us. We have providers uh, and hospitals out there with us as well. Um, and, you know, I think we all share the same goal. We, we see the value in moving away from fee for service. Um, but we also need to make sure that we are moving toward fixed perspective payment in a way that's going to benefit everyday Vermonters. Um, you know, certainly there's some uh, stability that fixed payment provides to the hospitals and other providers, and that's a laudable aim. But one of Blue Cross's goals is to make sure that fixed payment is not just good for providers, but it's also good for everyday Vermonters and Vermont small businesses and their employees as well. Um, and those, those goals can sometimes be at odds. And so we, we need to make sure we develop a system um, that, that delivers value to everybody um, and delivers value in a way that doesn't just end up with a UVM health network coming and saying, we need a 19.9% .9 increase on our fixed perspective payment next year. Um, because that's, that's not really any different from what's happening today. Um, so there's a lot of work to do in order to get there. Um, and we are absolutely committed to that work and participating, uh, uh, you know, as, as, as much as we possibly can in reaching that vision that Don George shared. Well, I, I would agree that I think, um, the concept is, is that with fixed perspective payments, some of the benefit of that and the innovation um, that comes along with it and uh, uh, falls to uh, the pocketbooks of ratepayers. Um, so it's not just uh, beneficial to providers, but it's also beneficial to ratepayers. I just worry that there's gridlock that, um, and I go back to last year where you had Blue Cross Blue Shield saying, we need some willing partners. And uh, Dr. Brumstead saying he'd be first in line. And here we are um, a year down the road, and I, I don't think we've moved the ball very far, at least it seems to me. Um, but that is what it's at. I just worry that as a long time goes by, rate payers or providers don't see the benefit of fixed prospective payments, although the folks in Medicaid say they have, a, have benefited by it, and the Medicare study says that they've benefited by it. But if I agree with you, if ratepayers don't begin to see the benefit of it, people are going to say, what good is it? And the clock is, has been ticking for a number of years now. Mm -hmm. um, 
My next one is uh, from the same email. Um, uh, Don George says, instead, we need to redouble our efforts to restructure our, um, hang on a minute. Let's see. We... He talks in this email. About he talk he talks about the cost shift and I, I I could find the exact quote here, but um so I just want to kind of raise uh, a question, and the trigger for it was that is in that email I just can't uh, find it right now, um you know about the cost shift and he he basically uh, says that uh you know they're not in control of the cost shift which is true Blue Cross Blue Shield is not in control of the cost shift, but um um I think oh here's what he said. He said the Green Mountain Care Board has no say over how much Medicare and Medicaid uh, pays hospitals. And while the underfunding of government payer exacerbates the problem, no one has the resources to keep pace with these shocking budget increases. Um, so uh, that's what he said uh, last March. And so I kind of went back into the. And you can see that um, from uh, 2017, they have they have one tab that uh, is is a five year trend for every appropriation in the state budget. So you can go to the global commitment, it's uh, uh, online, and see that you know since 2017, uh, the appropriation has risen at the annual rate of only four tenths of one percent, from 744.4 million to 758.3 million. Um, in the 2022 budget. It's notable as well that Diva underspent the 2021 budget in global commitment by uh, over 18 million, and that the 23 budget is reduced by 18.5 million from the 2022 uh, budget, mostly attributable to post-pandemic caseload reductions. As we came out of the pandemic, um, you know, there's been recertifications, et cetera. So, but these are still big numbers. I mean, in terms of your rate uh, request, you know, I think in dollars it's like 18.6 million uh, for the small group and 19.5 million, and this is before the adjustment up based on hospital budgets. Those are the dollars on on the, the surf filing, and uh, so that they're not out of the ballpark. They're not out of scale with each other. Yes, it's co co a complicated connection, but I just uh, so I, I guess I want to ask the question. Given that the trend rate on inflation is four tenths of one percent since 2017, and given that the appropriation in global commitment 2023 over 22 was reduced by 18.5 million, you know, did Blue Cross Blue Shield, who is not uninfluential, you do have influence, did you participate in any? Uh, um, efforts under the Golden Dome or at the State House to um, basically say, yeah, uh, caseloads are going down, you're saving some money, but you could put that money into rate, rate increases. You don't have to send it off to other parts of state government, which as a former guilty party, um, I can say, <laughs> you know, uh, that, 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 can, that can, I think I'm a guilty party. I hope I'm not a guilty party, but I probably am, you know, that, uh, um, uh, you know, uh, there, there's opportunity there to um, to pay providers more through Medicaid and take some of the cost pressure shift off of you folks. Yeah, we would we would certainly uh, welcome that sort of move. I I don't actually have knowledge of our uh, of our activities in Montpelier to effectuate that, uh, so I I can't speak to that with any degree of detail. Um, but I think, as you can tell from Mr. George's letter, uh, Blue Cross would certainly be supportive um, of those kinds of things. Um, my next is question has to do with just, uh, is there one number, in terms of the, the cost sharing increases that were recommended and approved by DIVA, mm -hmm. and a few of the minor ones by us, I think there were two or three on that list that we approved, mm -hmm. if, if, if that if that uh, those increases in cost sharing were translated into premium in increase, how much uh, on top of kind of the requested premium increase, what what would be the value of these cost sharing increases 
if they were translated into premium. So in other words, if we, if we hadn't increased the cost sharing and instead kept the cost sharing flat and allowed that to flow through premium instead? Right. Okay. Um, I, I don't have an exact number for you. Typically what we see is that the, um, the actuarial value of movement over time is usually a little bit over 1% per year. So if we if we keep them flat, that would be about a one percent, probably a little over a one percent premium increase. Um, you know, I, I will point out that there are uh, parameters within which we need to keep that the cost sharing. So a lot of the, that movement is kind of dictated by the need to stay within the the metal levels that are defined right. by the federal government. So I you know we we don't have I you know we don't have carte blanche uh, ability to just keep everything the same as it was, unfortunately. Yeah. Um, but yeah. Yeah. So I, I just asked that question more for the general public who might come to the hearing later on this week that mm -hmm. it's not only the premium increase, but it's also these cost sharing increases, My, a minor partner, but you know, once you get up into double digits, it's all adds, it, it all adds up. Um, my next question is, um, <clears throat> they basically kind of wondering uh, there was an article in the um, Vermont Digger this last week about how, you know, a reemergence of the pandemic a little bit or, or uh, of a different strain of virus might um, un, un, unsettle kind of the budget process this year. And mm -hmm. There's no, no doubt about that. But I just, I just wonder how, looking down the road six months or a year, how we we know what the impact is of this, uh, in, in your case, this $38.1 million increase investment in higher kind of higher premiums, you know, on a combined basis. So, um, and in a fee for service world, what, what should we look at to know that this investment is uh, doing the maximum amount it can for hospitals and independent providers, et cetera, to stabilize the system, hopefully coming out of the pandemic. What what should we, what are the measures we should look be looking at that that, that say this uh, this thirty eight million dollars is a lot of money, um, and part of it is just not to kind of, you know, um, uh, pay providers more, but it's strategically. Um, structured to stabilize the, the weaker members of our provider system? Yeah, that's a that's a great question. And I, I think the answer to that probably lies in the hospital budget uh, approval process more so than it than it lies in the rates. Um, I, I can, well, you know, I, I can say we, you know, we did include the impact of, of anticipated Green Mountain Care Board action on the hospital budget requests. Uh, we assume that impact would be in line with what it has been in the past. Um, and that's not to say that you'll treat every hospital the same. I'm, I'm quite certain that you won't. Uh, but at this point in time, it's, it's hard to anticipate a hospital by hospital uh, action that you're going to take. Um, as part of our advocacy for ratepayers, we'd, we'd certainly welcome and encourage you to take a really hard look at, at these hospital budget submissions uh, to ensure that that is money well spent. The um, kind of a related question, you know, well, let, 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 let me just say for, for me and my perspective, I'm not an actuary and I'm not a lawyer uh, kind of, uh, but, you know, <laughs> I try to avoid getting involved in those te technical weeds. Um, <laughs> but I, but I, you know, I, 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 given the actuarial process, I kind of wonder how um, how, how to integrate the, the economic context. So for example, Jeff Carr and Tom Kivet, uh submit their annual um, uh, economic forecast to the, um, to, to the uh, emergency board and the emergency board adopts it, which is a big formal deal in the process of the state government. They're looking, uh, their report to the emergency board was a 4.4% 2023 increase in gross state product and a 3.6% increase in personal income. Nowhere near where um, these rate increase requests are. And so I can understand from an actuarial basis where you're looking in the rearview mirror, and this is what you've seen, and you're projecting it forward, and you end up 
with this, you know, with this recommendation, that recommendation is still, you know, way out of context of what's going on in the underlying economy. The state budget, and just in terms of state funds, forgetting about all this federal money, the state budget uh, for 2023 over 2022 went down 5.4 percent. So it was it was a negative, and the, and over the the five years uh, going back uh, to 2017, it's been a 5.66 percent increase. So I look at that and I say, well, that's in touch with the economy, you know, um, and 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 uh, it's reasonable as opposed to where I started in the state budget, which was coming off high double digit numbers uh, in the CUNY administration. And then uh, we hit the 1990 recession and the bottom fell out and Dick Snelling had the sustainable send spending proposal um, that uh, Governor Dean em embraced. And uh, we went negative a couple of years on the state budget. So I'm just, I'm just wondering, given, you know, Given that the scale of this requested increase, um, whether or not this is a one-year issue or a three-year issue, I mean, it took us six or seven years to work out of the the um, bond rating went down, et cetera, et cetera, in the early 90s. And I'm just wondering if what the context for this increase is. Is this just one of a series, do you think, or is this a, a one-time fix to help stabilize the system and uh, stabilize providers. And we'll be back uh, in the, you know, four to 5% range in 2024. What are you, what's your thoughts on that? Yeah, what, what I can say is this, this increase is uh, inextricable from the hospital budget increases that you'll be considering next month. Um, as I've testified over 10 points of our final increase is due to increases in prices that providers are paid. Um, so that, that 10 points is certainly not uh, in step with the with the figures that you quoted for the broader economy as well. Um, as to how that's going to play out in the future, I, um, I, I'm not sure that I have a, a much better guess than anybody else. I'd, I'd like to think that the current batch of hospital budget requests are going to um, stabilize these hospitals that are asking for double digit increases. Not all of them are. There are certainly a few hospitals that are that are in the single digits, kind of in the mid single digits. And we we'd certainly love for that to be all hospitals. Um, I I believe the intention is to try to surmount these problems and put them in the rear view mirror, uh, talking about problems uh, budgetary problems hospitals are facing in terms of hiring uh, visiting nurses. Uh, uh, you know, doctors coming in to, to meet the demand. They've had workforce issues. So the sooner we can get that behind us, the sooner we can uh, return to normalcy, as as the phrase was coined. Um, can that be accomplished in a year? I I don't know. It's a it's a heavy lift that the that the hospitals are going to undertake. Um, my job really. Uh, while it's certainly technical, is in some ways a lot easier in that I, I simply am reflecting those cost increases in these rates. Uh, and when it comes to, to, to do 2024 20, rates, I'll take the same approach. I'll, I'll take a look at what's going on with the hospitals, um, what their financial performance has been, how the rate increases that will be approved uh, in September are going to impact that financial performance going forward. And I'll use all of that information to kind of inform what the 2024 increase is going to be. How's that going to play out? I, I think it really depends immensely on the extent to which hospitals are successful in stabilizing their own operations uh, and bringing some of those extra costs under control. Unfortunately, some of that probably also depends on what happens with the pandemic. Are, are we going to continue to see these these big waves that we saw in 2021 and even into 2022? You know, we're we're kind of experiencing more of a caseload now. Hospitalization is down in Vermont, but that's certainly not true across the country. There's there's many many areas in the country where hospitalization is is ramping up again um, due to COVID. So, gosh, a lot of it depends on the on the pandemic and the hospital's ability to kind of stabilize. Um, and I, you know. I, I kind of unfortunately lack a lack a good crystal ball about 2024. I have a pretty clear indication of what's likely to happen in 2023, 
Um, so I, I have been able to incorporate that into the rates, but that that work of incorporating uh, the increases in rates is, is pretty minor compared to the work of actually using those funds to stabilize uh, hospital operations so that we can uh, get back down toward uh, more affordable increases in the future. Uh, kind of building on that just a little bit, it's uh, and going back to the whole fee for service concept that uh, one of the only windows I seen on fee for service um, um, actually kind of playing out in the field is that very small study that we did on reimburse, um, price reimbursement. Um, I, I think it came out last spring where you can look at um, commercial payments to providers in the same year for the same procedure and see this wide variance, you know, and in, in, in how how the, that's applied, you know, with, within hospital budgets. And so I worry that we don't have a window to measure to, to kind of, you know, except for these very top side numbers to measure, you know, whether or not the use of these increased um, pr premiums is being done in as thoughtful and as uh, a kind of stabilizing manner as possible. My my last my very last question is the long shot here. But, uh, <laughs> um, it's um, you know as you know there you know CMS has this annual requirement for um, each hospital operating in the United States to provide clear accessible pricing information online about the mm -hmm. items and services they provide, um, in, including a unique list of. 300 shoppable items, uh, items and services, including 70 already defined by CMS. And I just wonder that we have this system in place already. Um, the federal government mandates it. Hospitals have to abide by it. Um, I've looked at some of those um, filings in hospitals, and it is chaotic. You know, it's 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 definitely uh, a system that you you know if you're if it's patient facing, it doesn't work very well for you. But if you're trying to look to see, follow the money, you know, in terms of procedures, it's not easy to deal with. I, I spent a lot of time with UVM's example, which is just this huge spreadsheet. Um, um, and I'm just wondering if whether or not we could play a role um, in finding a common format for each hospital to submit to CMS. And because it's a common format, the, 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 the utility of this federally mandated annually reported um, 300 shoppable uh, procedures is something that we can we can use to kind of uh, shine a light on where we are and and where the system might be working and where the system might not be working um, so that's that's my that that's my wish of the day and um, uh, if you can put some wind in that sail I'd appreciate it <laughs> <laughs> See what I can do. I think we would welcome that involvement, um, and we we agree with your characterization that the current uh, the currently it's quite chaotic. But it's a system that's out there, and uh, yes. you know I, I don't see why we couldn't say. And I don't think any of these uh, methods that any hospital in Vermont has used has been found in violation. So 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 it's not like you know we've got a bunch of bad apples out there. We've just got a a bunch of chaotic uh, apples, and uh, <laughs> just wa wondering if giving bringing order to that uh, would be helpful. So thank you um, for this, and uh, that's all I have to uh, to say and to inquire about. Next, we'll move to <clears throat> Member Holmes. Great, thank you. Um, Good morning, Mr. Schultz. How are you? <laughs> good morning. I am well, and it is still morning when I'm talking to you this year, so that's that's good. Barely, right? <laughs> Barely. <laughs> um, well, I, so many of my questions have actually been addressed by your testimony already, as happens Great. when you go towards the end, uh, but I do have a few. Uh, so actually, as it turns out, last Friday, the federal government did actually extend the public health emergency for um, another three months. And, you know, as you've already mentioned, it looks like we still have some, a few more worrisome new sub variants predicted mm. for the fall and COVID is still very much with us. And I assume that this latest extension and any subsequent extensions that we might see is going to postpone this redetermination of Medicaid eligibility. So how will these uh, public health emergency extensions impact 
your assumptions about Medicaid members transitioning to the exchange, and in particular, your assumptions about the population morbidity risk and utilization trend that you have in the filing right now? Great, great question. Um, so, so the assumptions that are currently in the filing are that the, the new members would not really have an impact on experience. We assume they would look a lot like our existing membership um, uh, by and large. Um, we, so the, the major impacts were really on administrative costs in terms of bringing them down. Um, and it, it, there are some kind of residual impacts on risk adjustment and, and other things like that. But we, we did not have any sort of, you know, massive or really particularly significant movement in terms of the, the cost, the claim cost, um, the biggest component of the premium. So there, there will absolutely be an impact when these folks flow into the market. But since we don't know when that's going to happen, it's hard to gauge what that's going to be. So uh, a couple of things. One is since we're pretty sure at this point that they're unlikely to be there at the beginning of the year, um, that does a couple of things. One is that um, our administrative costs will probably run a little bit higher on a PMPM -PM basis than what we have in the filings because we won't get that bump to membership. Um, another thing that could happen is if these members end up joining midstream Unless we have some sort of regulatory um, action, that means that their deductibles are going to start. Let's say they they enter the enter the fray in next August or something like that. You know, they'll have a short plan year, so their deductibles will apply for only five months instead of twelve. That means that their paid claims as a portion of the total are going to be low um, relative to the average member. So that that would actually offset the administrative cost impact. Um, the extent to which it offsets or overcomes it really depends on the timing of when those folks enter the market. And right now, that's that's kind of anybody's guess, I think, at this time as to when exactly they'll come in. So, um, you know, all that said, it's it's not, this isn't going to be, this is going to be something we measure in tenths of a percent. It's not going to be something we measure in, in full percentages. Um, so yeah, we'll we'll see how it plays out, but it's it should be a relatively minor impact at the end of the day. Okay. Um, and as I think everybody has already mentioned, this is a pretty unprecedented year in terms of expected increases in pharmaceutical drug prices and hospital rates and insurance premiums. Um, and I, I just want to probe a little bit. It's been touched on, but I want to probe a little bit deeper. You know, as people face these higher premium rates, I would anticipate and. Um, I would love to know your opinion on this, that people may drop metal levels with the higher premiums. Mm -hmm. um, they're then going to face greater cost sharing and they mm -hmm. may utilize less. And even within a metal level facing higher medical prices, they may also utilize less, particularly if they're in the, the metal levels with higher cost sharing. Mm -hmm. So do you have an estimate of this price responsiveness or elasticity and how do you account for it in your projections for utilization for 23, particularly given that this is a truly unprecedented year in terms of these, these deltas on the price increases. We may see an impact, and I'm curious as to how you've accounted for that. Yeah, so we, we, we did take a look at um, plan migration from 2021 to 2022, and we included that uh, in the filing. So that, that's in there. Uh, your question is more to do with anticipated plan migration to 2023, and that's a, that's a little bit harder to judge. Um, so we, we haven't, um, you know, I totally understand what you're saying. And I, I think that that could realistically happen. Um, we don't have an assumption that that's, you know, that that plan migration is going to, to increase because of the, of the higher prices. Um, it's possible that it will, I guess here, I'll just say uh, that, you know, plan migration over time. And we've had some, some, unfortunately, we've had some rather large increases in the past as well. And we've never noticed plan migration that has an impact of greater than a, a tenth or two of a percent um, on the on the final claims. So I, I don't think we're talking about a huge ticket item here, but I, I do hear what you're saying, and I think it would be reasonable to think about that. The other thing we did not include, although we, we could think about this too, is that um, unfortunately we could well see a rise in the uninsured rate um, with these large hospital budget increases driving large premium increases. Um, and 
typically when that happens, it's the healthier members who decide to leave the market. So that would have the opposite influence to the one that you're talking about, um, where that, you know, the healthier members leaving would drive premiums or drive claims per member per month higher than what we're showing in this filing. So there's, there's definitely some movement there. It will absolutely be different than the more or less status quo that we're assuming in the filing. Um, but it's, it's unclear to me that that movement will definitively be in one direction or the other. Um, and I think at the end of the day, given the, the, you know, we've for a very long time had a low um, uninsured rate in Vermont. Um, uh, and I, you know, I don't, I'd like to think that these increases are not going to change that uh, in an appreciable way. So I, I think at the end of the day, we're talking about a rather small impact in one direction or the other. Um, and I, you know, my, my best assumption for all of that stuff is to kind of go with the status quo assumption that that's, that's going to be a net neutral. And then we end up with just projecting the, the claims based on the population we already have. Okay. Um, and I apologize if I've missed my missed in the materials, my following question, if, if I have, please just point me to it. Or if you need to submit and follow up, that's fine too. But my question is, for the past five years, how have your actual administrative costs compared to your projected administrative costs at the time of filing? Ooh, interesting question. I don't think that is in the material, but I'm certain that's something we could follow up with. That would be great. Thank you. Um, and on page 28 of Exhibit 1, um, there's a table in there regarding the um, increase in fraud, waste, and abuse payment recoveries. Yes. And I'm just wondering if you can speak to what accounts for the increase in those fraud, waste, and abuse payment recoveries. You know, they're even now, last year was even higher than pre-pandemic. And my, mm -hmm. I guess my question is, what accounts for it? Are there more fraudulent and wasteful claims or are your teams better at detecting them? <laughs> <laughs> wow, what a loaded question. Uh, the, uh, the answer I think is twofold. One is we, we did suspend uh, quite a bit of, of FWA activity during the height of the pandemic in 2020. And so we've been sort of recovering uh, from that level. We know that was artificially dampened for a time. You can see it start to recover in, in Q4 um, but then really recover back toward and above pre-pandemic levels in, in 2021. The other part of it is uh, has to do with the vendors we're working with. We're, we're working with a few new vendors. Um, and and the, the way these things work, you, you know, it's, it, it's not really a, a sample kind of thing. You're not going to dig into a claim and say, ooh, this one, let's see, let's find out if this one's fraudulent. There's really a, a parameters or an algorithm that's set up to identify claims that may be an outlier for one reason or, or suspicious claims, I guess might be a way to put it. So if there's a if there's a certain parameter or part of the claim that doesn't fall within usual bounds or standards, that's when we'll pull out and take a look at it and investigate. So it's it's really the the improved algorithms that we're using on the vendor side that's helping us to identify more claims that we need to take a closer look at. Um, and that's that's why the you know we we don't think the 1.99 percent we achieved in 2021 is going to turn out to be a high outlier. We've assumed that we'll be con, we'll be able to continue to uh, identify claims at that same level, about two percent, as we move into the future. Um, ideally, we you know providers will learn learn you know, and typically this happens. Providers learn that they can't code in a certain way, or um, and so they'll, they'll make adjustments to make sure that what they're what they're doing on the on the coding side and submitting claims is is proper and in alignment. I don't think we have any real bad actors um, out there, um, but we we do think we'll be able to continue to achieve that two percent as we move forward. How does that two percent number compare to benchmarks you might use or other Blue Cross Blue Shield organizations across the country? Yeah, it, it aligns pretty well. Um, it, to my recollection, uh, uh, we presented a, a great deal of the testimony last year on those national benchmarks, and I, I could probably flip through and find it and read from it. Um, it's not necessarily my area of expertise, but it, at a high level, it, it aligns pretty well with, with what, we, uh, what we see others attempting to achieve or actually achieving nationally. Okay, great. Those are my questions, Chair Mellon. Thank you very much, Mr. Schultz. You're welcome. Okay, we'll move to board member Walsh next. 
Thank you. And hello, Mr. Schultz. Hello, Mr. Walsh. Nice to meet you. Likewise. Um, thanks for your uh, presentation today, going through the numbers. I want to ask a couple questions just about affordability. Um, you, you talked about it earlier, mentioned that it's something that um, you and your organization care about. Um, and I'd like to just make sure that I understand how you assess it, how that's how that's measured or, or looked at. I think I got a couple things with, when you were talking earlier about um, the quality of the products that Blue Cross offers and that some of them um, save more money than they cost and that um, your, your cost of insurance charges are quite a bit less than allowable. Those are the two, two things that I had in my notes. But I'm wondering if there, if there are any other measures of affordability. Um, yes, there, there are, yeah, affordability as, as you're aware is, has not been defined um, in, the, in the standards and the rules. Um, so there, there are a number of different ways that you could assess affordability. Um, one point that we've always held to is that um, we do have to employ community rating. That's a requirement in Vermont. So one thing we cannot do is say, well, this person is healthy um, and this is their income level. So they're, prob they're probably not going to have a lot of claims because they're healthy. Here's their income level. So we're going to charge them a certain amount. And then this person over here who's who's going to consume a million dollars of health care, um, you know, our premiums are incredibly affordable for that person, right? They're, they're, they're paying um, a certain amount for an insurance product and the benefit they're getting is a million dollar benefit from that product. That's affordable, I think, by any definition. Um, so the question to us really becomes, so is this rate affordable for the community of subscribers? And I, I think the, you know, the two things you talked about are very important. Um, looking at our cost of insurance, looking at the value that we bring and the savings we're able to bring to the premiums compared to what we charge for our part of the premium, which is the cost of insurance. But the bigger component is taking a look at those claim costs and the projection of that and making sure that there's no kind of um, margin or fluff in there. We're doing a fair and adequate job of projecting future claims. Um, and we, you know, that's part of that is Lewis and Ellis's rule. They, they do a very in-depth examination of the work that we've done to make sure that we're not, um, we're not doing something improper. Or we're not doing something that results in a rate that's too high that we are in fact fairly reflecting um, the 90 plus percent of premium that, that is driven entirely by the, the cost of care um, in Vermont and, and outside of Vermont as our members travel. Um, they've done so and they've agreed with the, with the one exception that we've talked about. There is one point of contention this year, um, but Lewis and Ellis has agreed that the numbers that we're putting in there, that is a reasonable projection. And I can also look at our historical financial results and determine by looking at those that we do a, a pretty good job of projecting that 90 plus percent component of premium. If I look at our actual financial performance versus our expected to financial performance over the years, which is um, that's in the binder uh, at exhibit one, page six. Um, we can see that over the entirety of these products, the approved contribution reserves, so the approved amount that we, we thought we would be able to put into reserves after paying for all the claims and the administration was 0.6%, and the actual result has been 0.2%. So our, our assumptions over time have been a little bit aggressive. That is, they've produced rates that have been slightly under, um, I'm sorry, we produce, yes, we produce rates that have been slightly under um, what, what's actually turned out. Actual experience has been very slightly higher. So, um, you know, I, if the rating rules were different and I could take a look at something like age rating, for example, you know, we, we, I hear from a lot of families in public comment that come and say that this, this is just way too much for a young family to pay for. And I personally don't necessarily disagree with that. 
but I'm not allowed to use age rating in Vermont. I'm, I'm not allowed to reflect the fact that a young family of, of two 30 year olds and a, and a child or two is likely to spend a lot less on healthcare than a couple that's in their early 60s. And we can debate the policy merits of, of that you know, at, at length. Um, but the fact is, I, I'm not allowed to rate that way. And so it may well be that the coverage could be considered unaffordable by that young family of four. And part of the reason for that is that they're being charged more than they're likely to consume um, within that insurance. But the flip side is true for that couple in their 60s, right? So, but we can't look at it individually. We have to look at it in the community because I have to use a community rate in okay. these products. Yeah, and, and I hear you, we could, we could debate it. I happen to think that that's probably, the community rating is probably a better way to go, um, but it's debatable as, as you talked about. The, the thing that I'm trying to get my head around as a new board member and trying to understand affordability, um, it seems to me we don't have a good measure of it. From, from the consumer or the, the individuals needing health care, right? You, you had an example of someone who has a million dollars worth of expenses mm -hmm. and that um, because they don't pay in that much, it would be absolutely affordable. And I don't quite agree there. Their premiums may still be not affordable for them because oftentimes the people who are sickest and have the most need for health care are unable to work as much. Right, so this this affordability nugget is tough, but it's in the models and the range of variables you nicely described stochastic models. I have fond memories of them for my dissertation. <laughs> you describe a range of variables, right? Um, we don't have something like that for affordability. And so that's not playing into our models the same way. We get 74 pages of public comments that things are not affordable but we don't have a good measure of it yet. And I, I think that's a, that's a weakness. Um, but I appreciate your calm explanation through things. You're very clear and, and I appreciate you doing that. Um, so thank you very much. Thank you for the kind words. That's all, back to you, Mike. Two questions from Chair Mullen. Thank you. Um, Mr. Schultz, uh, we hear continually about uh, the lack of capacity in the mental health system, and we hear continually about increased demand. You're projecting that um, the, the costs are going to go up, but what leads you to believe that there's sufficient capacity in the existing mental health system that would allow for those additional costs to you as a payer? Good question. Um, part of the answer to that is telemedicine. There's an increasing use of, of telemedicine in the mental health space. Um, it's proven to be very effective clinically. Um, so part of the way that we're uh, uh, reacting to the demand for mental health services is by increasing the supply through telemedicine. You don't necessarily have to hang a shingle in Vermont in order to um, help a Vermonter with their mental health. Um, and I. You know, I'll, I'll admit I, I can't really speak in a great deal of depth about the initiatives that we have currently underway, um, but the mental health space is one that is very important to Blue Cross Blue Shield of Vermont, uh, particularly through our, our Vermont Collaborative Care Initiative. Um, and we, you know, we've we will continue to uh, to make sure that we're working within this space to make sure that 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 um, additional demand is met. When you take a look at uh, um, patient acuity, um, utilization trends, mm -hmm. are they indicative, since Blue Cross is the largest commercial payer in the state, are they indicative of um, your company's efforts at prevention and wellness and care management? Yes. Yes, all of that is embedded within the experience that we analyzed to, to come up with those trends. So. We're effectively assuming that the success we've had with all of those efforts uh, will continue to produce better and better results as we move forward in time. You blocked out for a second, but I think I got your answer. 
And uh, that was all I had for questions. So thank you. Thank you, Chair Mullen. I believe uh, Robin had asked for an opportunity to follow up on anything. Yes, thank you. I just have a couple more that I missed the first time around. Sorry about that. Um, Mr. Schultz, could you take a look at Exhibit 23, page 12? It's attachment A to the supplemental pre-filed testimony that you provided. Getting there. Um, Let me know when you're there. I've got it. Awesome. So uh, in that bottom table for um, historical total medical PMPM match populations, uh, I noted that you had a two-year trend and a four-year trend. Mm -hmm. uh, did you calculate a three-year trend? And uh, do you know what that would be? We did. We're not displaying it because of the severe disruption that COVID had in 2022. I, I don't have the number in front of me. Um, we could do the math and figure that out. But as you can see, that 2020 PMPM PM is significantly dampened. Uh, sure. because of the impact of COVID. So we, we do have the number, but I, I don't think it's particularly indicative of anything useful. Okay, I'd just be curious to see what it is, understanding, of course, about COVID. Sure. Um, and then uh, my, the other question I had is, um, so you testified today that you were not surprised that the 2019 utilization was lower than 2018 medical utilization because it was an outlier. Is that right? Because the 2018 utilization was an outlier. Yes, that's yes. correct. Yes. Yeah. Uh, and in the 2020 rate filing, however, you did assume a positive utilization trend, did you not? I will have to take your word for that. Okay. I, we, we most likely did, yes. Okay, thank you very much. That's all I have, Mike. Okay, before we get back to redirect, um, there was an email exchange. Uh, the HCA had asked for um, the email from Don George that board member Pelham referenced. Um, and there were a number of other factual statements that are not in the record that were referenced. Um, one of them being, you know, continuation of the public health emergency, things like that. Um, I, I expect that we may uh, propose to take judicial notice of certain facts. I, I would anticipate that that would come uh, after the hearing, so something we'll deal with in writing after the hearing, but uh, would like to hear from the parties about that at this time. Um, thank you, Mr. Barber. I, you know, I think we, I don't anticipate objecting, but would want to see the, you know, specific proposal. Um, we're we're fine with your proposal, uh, Mr. Hearing Officer. Okay. I think you're you're muted, Mr. Barber. Oh, I said it, I'll turn it back to you for any redirect. Um, would it be all right if I just took a, ask for a brief couple minute recess to review my notes? Yes. Uh, why don't we reconvene at quarter till noon? Okay. Thank you. Hello again, Mr. Schultz. Hello, Mr. Battles. Uh, <laughs> uh, Mr. Angov asked you uh, a few questions about uh, the actuarial standards of practice or ASOPs and how they impact your medical trend assumptions. Um, I'd ask you if you could turn to your supplemental profile testimony at Exhibit 23 and specifically page 8. Okay. Uh, and if you could just 
review your, your first response on the top of page eight and then sort of summarize that response for the board. Um, yes, so the, the question is whether, uh, is in what way the l &E opinion contained uh, what I believe to be a clear error. And that has to do with uh, the actuarial standards of practice, which do prescribe that the actuary should determine the extent to which past experience trends are relevant to assumed future trends. Um, so you know, Mr. Angoff was, was asking me a series of questions about whether those standards of practice are prescriptive in terms of this precise methodology that is used to assess those trends and, and the, the standards are not. Um, but they are prescriptive in, in, in saying that the actuary must uh, assess how past trends may or may not be indicative of future trends. Thank you. And, and then I just uh, a couple of additional questions to follow up on, on some of the uh, some of Mr. Angoff's questions about um, specific numbers in, in the uh, actuarial report. And so if you could turn to the report, which is exhibit one and uh, specifically page 21. And uh, you could take um, a moment to review sort of the, the first paragraph on that page and then explain to uh, uh, whether that uh, addresses the impact that the Civica RX initiative has on the file rates. It, it does indeed. Um, yes, yeah, so this, the bulk of this paragraph has to do with the impact of, of Civica RX on um, specialty drugs. Uh, so I, I was asked earlier to point to the number that we included in the rate filing, and, and in fact, there it is. Uh, so at the top of the page, we included a factor of 0.9974 um, that, that was applied to specialty drugs for the impact of Civica. As I testified earlier, it's you know Civica RX is just starting production, so the impact is not immense um, in in 2023. You're not expected to be immense in 2023, but we we do hope that that gains momentum over time and becomes a, a more significant number. And then just one more question, uh, in turning to binder exhibit two, which contains uh, the exhibits to the actuarial report. If you could look at page um, 26. Okay. And um, if you could explain what we're looking at there. I should have retrieved my magnifying glass in our five minute break, but I, I failed to do so. But um, this, this appears to, to be, um, uh, I was asked earlier for um, uh, a demonstration of the mental health utilization that led me to conclude that an eight and a half percent utilization trend was appropriate moving forward. Um, and, and this would be that data. So this is the mental health and substance abuse uh, services data that we use to construct that eight and a half percent utilization assumption. Thank you. Uh, no further questions. Mr. Angoff, do you have any additional cross on that on those issues? No questions. Okay. And I think we need to deal with when to have an executive session because I did hear. Mr. Angoff and uh, board members have some questions about confidential material. And um, I'd ask you, Mr. Chair, do you have any preference? Do you, would you like to do it before we go into a lunch break? Um, group it with any executive session we have around uh, Ms. Green's testimony. What, what would you like to do? My preference would be to group it with lunch, and I do not have a preference whether it's pre-launch or apre launch, but as long as it's during that break, it allows the public to know that we'll be back uh, um, within a certain uh, estimable amount of time um, that they can uh, know that uh, they can tune back in. So either before or after launch um, would be best. Okay, I would propose before lunch just to continue with 
the flow of testimony and not break it up. Um, if that is OK with the parties. Uh, Mr. Hearing officer, do you mean the the entire uh, executive session before lunch, including both the hospital related issues and the RBC related issues or just the hospital related issues? Uh, so it would just be questions for Mr. Schultz um, on confidential. on confidential RBC related materials, which we haven't spoken about yet. Right. Are, are you assuming those would be before lunch too? Uh, I, yes, um, I'm asking if that is okay with the parties or whether they would prefer it be after lunch. Uh, <laughs> I don't think we have an objection to, to doing the session before, before lunch. Um, I will note that you know we we do as you know have a uh, Ruth Green testifying uh, today uh, also and and she may be the witness better suited to address some of the RBC questions. I'm just letting Jay know that for his. Yeah, uh, Mr. Hearing Officer, I I prefer to do the RBC questions after lunch, if that's at all possible. Uh, just because I think together they're going to take a while. OK, well, it sounds like. So I'm hearing Ben say that some of the RBC questions may be more appropriate for Ruth. I think in the past we've had. Uh, Ruth and Paul kind of testify in an executive session. Uh, together, I think maybe that might make the most sense, but that means uh, I think that we can't group it with lunch. So that's the trade off, but I think that's probably. OK, so so why don't we so I'm proposing that we plan an executive session for uh, Ms. Green and Mr. Schultz for this afternoon following kind of at the tail end of Ms. Green's testimony. Does that sound? OK to the parties. Yes. Fine with the HCA. OK, any concerns from board members on that plan? OK, then why don't we break for lunch at this time? Um, when we come back, uh, the next witness is Kevin Ruggeberg from Lewis and Ellis. Then we'll hear from Ruth Green. <clears throat> uh, then we'll have the executive session, I assume, hear from Jesse Luce here at DFR, uh, and then from Mike Fisher. Okay, so I, I that's a lot to get through, so why don't we take a half an hour lunch? Is that, is that okay? Yes. Okay, so we'll um, reconvene this hearing at 1230 and hear from Mr. Ruggerberg. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks.